minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. Coolest Reptile Podcast in the World, episode 457, All in the Tree Tuesdays, with my boy Alan from Amazing Basins. What is good, everyone? I'm your boy MJ. Happy Tuesday, fam. What is good? Uh, this is your first time hanging out. You're into keeping reptiles. If you're into learning about emerald tree boas, you're in for a treat tonight. Hit that like button. Smash that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Select all. You'll be on top of every single podcast I drop here. I drop three podcasts a week on Trap Talk for now. You notice how I keep saying for now? Just be, Just wait. Um, but you can also listen to Trap Talk on all the major audio platforms, Buzzsprout, Apple, uh, Spotify. So if you're not a YouTube person, just rather listen, there it is all for you. Okay. But just want to say from the bottom of my heart, wherever you listen to Trap Talk Reptile Podcast, thank you so much. It means a lot. All the listeners, um, all the support, all the feedback just really motivates me, fuels me to con continue to just think about how I can make this bigger and things are on their way so all because of your support thank you so much now if you're looking for exclusive content if you want to support what i have going on more further than just watching and if you just want to get connected to some of the best people in the reptile game then click the very first link in the description below and join the trap talk patreon family as soon as you join the trap talk patreon family you get a link to the discord we'll tap you in with over 200 trappers non-stop crap get cracking in the discord there's also a, a trap fam instagram group chat which is amazing just a Fun way to learn and grow with an awesome community within the reptiles, man. So, trappers, I love you guys. You guys are my heart. Big details coming soon for Trap Fest 2024. Invite only to the Trap Talk Patreon members. And yes, be ready. It's going down. Shout out to US Arc, okay? US Arc is here to help us. So, let's help them fight for us. Go down to the second link in the description. If you don't know what US Arc is, click on it, read all about it. Consider becoming a member today because these numbers really matter. There are a lot of heavy legislations in motion right now as we speak. U.S. Arc Florida and U.S. Arc um, just needs to come to, you know, everyone needs to come together for these two and make sure we support them. If you keep reptiles, you should, becoming a, you should become a, a U.S. Arc member today for sure. So, Phil Goss, thank you for everything that you do. Shout out to the entire U.S. Arc team. Uh, tonight's episode is brought to you by... One of my favorites in the game, for sure. Gary Shavino over at GS Reptiles. Guys, on YouTube, you can learn so much from this guy's channel. Let's get this guy to 10K for sure, because he's Gary Shavino and his content second to none. It's awesome. My favorite reptile YouTube channel to learn from. I've been saying this for uh, over two years now, and I think you guys need to hop on this train if you're not already. GS Reptiles, baby. GS Reptiles, hit that subscribe button. And also, follow him on Instagram. I would suggest if you can add him on Facebook too, because he just drops heat everywhere. Anywhere you can see this guy on social media, he drops some availability and it's random. It's super hot. It goes very quick. Just be on top of it. GS Reptiles. Thank you so much, Gary Javino. You're my dog. Appreciate all the love and support. Also, tonight's episode is brought to you by my boy, Brian Susan over at Sundown Reptiles. If you are like me and you have been obsessing over tree monitors and you're like, you know what? It's about that time. Well, this is your guy. All right. This is the tree monitor. Like he's the man right here, in my opinion. There's also other guys doing the tree monitors. All right. There's Brandon Van Ass in Canada, but in America, this is my this is my whole Kogan when it comes to tree monitors, man. And you guys need to tap in with Brian Susan from Sundown Reptiles. Head over to his website, see what he has available. I know I'm going hard on the tree monitors, but he also has amazing gecko species as well. Just see what he has. He like he he produces some really awesome stuff, and you can find all that stuff at his website. All that information in the description below, so make sure you click on it. Thank you, Brian, for your love and support. Also, if you think about diversifying your diet when it comes to reptiles, you better think about that quail, man, and get your number one top quality quail from my boy Blake over at Blake Exotic Feeders. You could have, head over to his website, but I highly recommend just hitting him up directly on IG. Let him know that the trap sent you, and he will take care of you on shipping, all sorts of stuff, man. This guy's taking care of all my trap fam, and I appreciate you so much, Blake. Big things coming. This guy's taking over the quail game. That's a fact. Blake from Blake Exotic Feeders. Go follow him on IG. Let him know that the trap sent you, all right? Last but not least, shout out to David Brahms, the Reptile Perch. Everything you see behind me in my Focus Cube Habitat PVC built enclosures, 
All these arboreals are chilling on a reptile perch, PVC perch. From the homie, David Brahms, make sure if you're getting into the arboreal game, if you got your focus cube habitat that you're ready to deck out, don't look any further than getting these affordable perches, man. And David Brahms just does it right. Just been doing it. Just killing it. Thank you so much, David. Uh, also, you can get conjure availability at his website as well. David Brahms is well dialed into the Green Tree Python game, all right? But guess what? Green Tree Python talk, usually what we do here almost every Tuesday, putting that on the shelf tonight, all right? And I'm going to ask my two co-hosts what they feel about that. Marshall Mendez in the building. Hey, hey. hey. Coach hey. Rice. What up, what up? Marshall, What's up? Are you, are you using Wi-Fi, Marshall? Uh, how is it tonight? Is it pretty good? It's no, no. <laughs> not good. It's not that bad. Okay, it's better. It's better, but motherfucker. No, it's not. It's not. I'm not on Wi-Fi. Okay, okay. I thought. It, it... <laughs> that's, a, that's a weekly problem. Shoot, yeah, well, yeah. some say it's a problem. I don't know. It's fine. It's fine for me. But if, if you care about looking at who you're talking about, yeah, it's a problem for sure. <laughs> um, uh, hey, but man, what's up, fellas? Hey, uh, Marshall Mendez. You know, you know Chris Rice. Have you met him before? I don't know if we have. I, no. I don't think so. No, not yet. Unless I may have seen you like way. I mean, we wouldn't have remembered each other back then as far as like chatting or anything. But I, there's a chance I might have may have seen you at one of the Daytona shows when. Yeah, when possibly. Big Condro setups way back in yep. the day. Yeah. Yeah. He goes way back, Marshall. Like he's been doing it for a minute. You know, he's he's out of Florida. He's been going to Daytona since since you were a kid, right, Chris? Like you've been going to Daytona for a while. Yeah. Nice. When it was first, yeah. When the, went to the first one was when it was still Orlando. So it was 94. Yeah. Oh, you went to the first one, the very first no, one. No, not the very first one. I'm saying the first one I went to was still in Orlando. Oh, okay. I think okay, the first gotcha. one was 91 or 92, something like that. The first one I went to was 94. Dang, so, epic. Yeah, those well, ones were amazing. As, as I said, no green tree python. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk maybe if it comes up. But man, this is about the emerald tree boas. And and I, I know you know Alan, right, Marshall? You know who the homie Alan is. Of course, right? yeah. I've known him for a long time. Good guy. And Chris, what do you know about Alan from Amazing Basins? Uh, seems like a really, really good guy. He's got a absurd collection, that's for damn sure. Um, just really top-notch animals, and I love those HQ stripe animals he's got as well. And um, yeah, I've watched him. I, I haven't met Alan personally yet, but um, definitely seen him on the, the interviews and chatted a little bit on IG and stuff like that. If you get a chance to ever run into Alan at like at a Tinley or something, or if you just have a chance to ever chop it up with him, one of the nicest guys you ever meet. And yeah, he's just imagine. very, like his approach to everything is just so just polite and just awesome. And, you know, there's not ever like, you don't ever feel a sense of cockiness from the guy. Like it's just like, he just has so much to just be cool to you about. And it's, and it's awesome to meet someone like that, but also like, you know, look at his collection. Like you said, you know, like it's, it's not the whole quantity. It's the quality behind the, this guy's work. And, Marshall, and this is why I feel like, you know, me and you, Chris, we're in for a treat because we're going to be learning a lot. I know you've bred Northerns, um, uh, I think, two years in a row or three years in a row, Chris. Remind me. Yeah, three years in a row. Coming up three on four. Years. Some three nice years. ones, too. Yeah. Nice one. <laughs> yeah. It. And, you know, but here we are talking about the basins, right, which, you know, very similar, obviously. It's Emerald Tree Boa, but, man, Marshall, real quick, the ringer you've been through with the basins, huh? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's actually gone pretty well, except for one litter. Um, I've had three litters. One was, <clears throat> I don't know, to, I can't remember, 2013, maybe 10 years ago, for 12 years ago, and then another one in 21. And uh, the one this year was uh, was 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 bad. The first two were, were pretty good. Right. Well, we'll get into so, detail as far as what happened to the one this year, right? Because was it, wait, late, late last year or this year when that happened? It was, uh, I say this year, yeah, it was like the end of last year. Okay, all right. Yeah, we'll get into detail. But, like, if you could kind of picture, like, someone who's wondering, well, Marshall, are, are you more, like, if you see a, if you see a emerald tree, a basin ovulation or a green tree python ovulation, which one do you really feel better about? Uh, well, the basin ones are way easier to, to tell from what I've seen. Uh, all, all the emeralds are. That seems to be way more pronounced, um, I would say. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, it, there's no question. I've never missed one, um, where I have missed plenty of ovulations with chondros. Yeah. But what I mean is like, okay, you see obviously two big ovulations in front of you at the end of the day, you know, we, we don't like to count any eggs or litters that are here yet, but like, what's one in your heart. Do you feel like one's going to go through the better, the chondros or the, or the emeralds? I mean, I would have said emeralds, but this last one, uh, you have to yeah, this last one fucked me up. Yeah. So, Damn. you know, 
So, well, that's what I'm saying. It's going to be a lot of great talks about ups and downs with, you know, working with stuff that we love. At the end of the day, this is an animal that if you keep it, you're legit passionate about an animal like this or an animal tree bow in general, man. Like this is why it's going to be a very, uh, very deep conversation as far as working with basins tonight. And I can't wait. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready to rock and roll. You ready to bring the homie Allen in or what? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right, guys. Shout out to everyone in the live Let's chat. Let's do it. I appreciate you guys in the live chats. Um, if you have any questions or a topic or anything you want to throw at us, drop a super chat. Do not be shy with the super chats, but uh, it's that time. It is that time to get your mind right. Time to stay hydrated. Episode 457 coming at you right now. All in the tree Tuesdays. Amazing basins. Let's go. Cheers. Good. You ready for do do more in the future? Trap yes. talk podcasts? Yes. Man, only, only trap talk exclusive. Yes. Exclusive. exclusive. <laughs> oh. So stop calling us. <laughs> From the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, I love it, love it, and not them hop from the hop to the club to spot. Get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up. Get the club to pop when I come up Everybody, we do it Everybody, we do it live episode 457 amazing basins in the building what's good alan what's up my guys what's up man? alan what's, what's up, up man what's up man what up man? how's it going chilling chilling not too bad how you guys doing good bro doing great yeah, real good happy to yeah, have I'm, you back i'm sweating balls over here <laughs> the I turned, room I turned right my now. fans off and now I'm just sitting here roasting. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually pretty hot too, to be honest. I just felt that too. I'm like, damn, I'm kind of, I don't know what's going on, but my ambience up, man. But what's going on, bro? You're you're in a new room. You you, you tell us about the room you're in right now. Let's get straight to it. Yeah. All right. So um, I I in my old place, my room was in the basement, right? So I had um, you know, just a. I just uh, built out a room inside the basement and I kept everything uh, as is, right? I just set it up as as automated as possible. And then my wife and I, we bought a new house and the house included a barn. Um, so we, we gutted the barn out and then we built out this room, you know, from the ground up. So um, it has everything that I need in here. I, everything is on timers. So I have a mini split, I have heaters, I have fans, I have um, a CFM fan, which uh, helps to circulate the air better. So it'll, it'll draw all of the, the stagnant air out and then it just kind of pushes it up. Um, but everything here is on automation. So right before the show started, I had to kind of turn everything off, like the, uh, the automation settings, so right. that I can keep the lights in here. Because normally at this time, you know, the room um, starts to cool down, right? Because it's warm during the daytime. So that's when the CFM, uh, CFL fan, fans kick in and then they just start, you know, kind of like drawing off that warm air. Uh, so that fan is actually on the ceiling. So it's basically just a bathroom, a bathroom fan. And then where does it, where does it just goes up through the ceiling? Yeah. Yeah. And then I have um, two big fans, you know, that help to circulate the air a little bit more. So around this time, that's when the room really starts to cool down. Um, so during the daytime, I keep my temps at 84 degrees, 82, 84. And then at nighttime, you know, I, I try to drop it down to 78. Okay. And, and I remember you saying that, you know, you used to kind of dabble with like dropping the temps down low, like I think at one point, but because you had, you know, 
not so much good luck one year, you stop messing with that and you you keep your ambient pretty like at a set number now, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. So I know a lot of people, they, you know, there's a lot of different strategies on how you could um, keep, you know, emeralds. As long as you, you're, you stay within a safe range, you're fine. But, um, but I found that I don't need to drop temperatures to, um, to you know, kind of induce copulations or to get them to breed. So I just keep the same temperatures year round. I just have a daytime high and then a, and then a nighttime low. Um, but um, I did. Want and to you, don't, you don't change it at all? <clears throat> what's up you don't change it at all throughout no. the year you just just leave. okay do you yeah. get any any influence from the outside though that does change it a little bit or is it totally so, completely um controlled? yes yes so like when i designed this room i wanted to go heavy on insulation so the the this the floor is raised up i want to say it's raised maybe like 12 inches oh we lost them uh oh volume Hey, hey, Alan, oh, Alan, Alan, we lost you. We lost you. We lost you. He just keeps going. <laughs> hey. Alan. He's on a roll and it's just. Yeah. He's, he's, we, yeah. We, 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 he's we, on we a roll, but we lost him. Lost the audio anyways. Hey, we lost audio. We lost audio. Can you hear us? We lost audio. We can't. He can't yeah. Can you say, say, say again? Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go. Now we can. Start over. Yeah, we, <laughs> my, phone, my phone's blowing up, but um, so. I um, I did have like, so I, I put in a mini split, which I never used before in my last room in the basement. So let me just back up really quickly. Yeah, yeah please. <laughs> Basements are really good for keeping um, temperatures like dialed in, right? You got, you know, thermal mass, not to get too nerdy, but um, underground, the temperatures are really stable. And then above ground, the higher you go, that's where you deal with more fluctuations. Hey, Alan, so, hey, Alan, we lost you when you said 12 inches, uh, and, and you said 12 inches, and then we lost you. So we didn't even get to hear the part when you said about the floor. All right. So I was saying that um, that I have a subfloor, okay. and it's the subfloor is raised up 12 inches, and then right. I have a layer of insulation on the floor, oh, and then right. on all of the walls, and then the exterior walls have a, a two-inch um, spray foam insulation. So... Like I keep this room as insulated as possible um, because since this room is above ground, the temperatures, I have to deal with the temperatures outside. And I'm in the Northeast where right now, I think it's like, I want to say 28 degrees. Damn. So, so you, have, you have any windows? No, no windows. No windows at all. Wow. So all the light is even, is even, uh, you're manipulating the light as well, huh? Just yeah. 12 on, 12 on, 12 off. Do you change that at all? No, no, it stays consistent year round. I mean, I was, gonna, I was gonna say so, thank you. I think I was gonna say also thank you for at least breaking the rules a little bit and still doing the show. We know we know Socrates just would have said no, and he would have been in this kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> well, normally I, this is my bedtime too, so okay. I'm like, ah, right, you know what? I'm gonna stay up late for tonight. Right on. Okay, continue though. I'm sorry. So, um, but I so in this room I have mini splits. And um, what's so cool about the mini split is that they turn on, this is a special one, I think it's from um, someplace in Japan, where they work even when it's negative 13 degrees outside. But what I didn't know is uh, when it gets that cold, um, it turns on and it turns off because it's trying to heat itself up. I don't really know how the unit works, but, it's, um, but I was just told that this is one of the best units you can get and that I, I won't have a problem maintaining temperatures. And that wasn't the case last year. So last year I did have some, um, some fluctuations. And what I did to solve that problem was I just added two, um, two additional radiant heaters, like um, the oil filled heaters. And, um, and that makes me, you know, help to stabilize the temperatures a lot better. Yeah. I mean, man, when it comes to your kind of ambience out there, as far as what you deal with temper changes, it, you, you have to do st extra stuff to that room for sure. Um, yeah. Like, like yeah. me, I can get away with a mini split and like, okay, I'll open my door if I need to, like it's, you know, uh, but, but where you're at, and I'm sure there's a time and place of the year you could do that, like during the summertime and stuff. But, um, but like even during the summertime, right. Like, or during warmer temps, that room is still controlled and it's not changing from what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Now I have it dialed in. So it, it took a while for me to get to this process because, right. you know, I'm still learning about this. I didn't really know anything about construction. 
So, you know, um, I had to learn about that just to make sure that I can keep these animals as healthy as possible. I learned Some of that stuff you don't know until you're dealing with it, like when the winter comes. You just <laughs> exactly. like, oh, I didn't anticipate that. You got to make adjustments. Exactly. Yeah, I, I also learned don't pay in full. Like, pay until the job's done because motherfucker, this, this guy, I forgot his name, for sure, illegal alien, though, and he took off and never came back, and I was so upset, bro. I was, it wasn't a fun time. So a lot of things to learn when it comes to, like, redoing a whole room and shit like that because, um, you know, you rely on people, you know, and sometimes, like, I, let me ask you this. Did stuff get prolonged because – like a shortage. I mean, I know there was this is during a time where like everything lagged, right? When it came to like even people coming to do electrical work and stuff like that. Like, did it take a lot longer than you expected? Yeah, yeah. You know, and you know, I'm I'm also dealing with like I, I built this out within the last year. So there's been supply chain issues, but then everything that I buy is also, you know, one and a half times more expensive. So anything, you know, you buy this room is taller than uh, most rooms. This room is um, is nine and a half feet tall because I wanted high ceilings because I had all the room, which right. means that I can't use regular like say two by fours. I gotta get I gotta get the ten footers, and then we gotta chop them down. And you know, there's a markup on all that stuff. Marshall's in construction, so I know he knows about that. Yeah, yeah, that's the name of the game. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm just learning as I go. So let's kind of talk about where things are at, you know. Um, well, okay, first off, when was your last uh, breeding uh, pair that went down with basins? Let's talk about that. Was it sometime last year, or let's take us back to your last pairing that you had going on? I mean, I got a pairing going on right now. Well, I just separated them. Um, but, um, yeah, the last pairing that I got was uh, two years ago, and um, I bred Yoda to a female named Princess Fiona. Right, and you had how many from that litter? Seven babies, and, seven babies, and two um, two slugs. Right now, can we kind of talk about what what is what it is to, to think about if you get a basin that either slugs out or let's just say they give you one baby or two babies and like six seven slugs, like what's there to really think about if something like that were to go down? I mean, it just comes with the game, really. You know, it's. But what, what I would do is I would, you know, look at my temperatures. Right. Usually when you deal with slugs, usually, I mean, it could come from both sides, but I would say that it's mostly on the males. If people are keeping their snakes, because I, I also have ball pythons, and I've had ball pythons, you know, in the past too. And if you, keep, if you keep your males too warm, then usually the sperm isn't viable, and, and then the, they won't be able to fertilize, the, you know, the, the, the ova from the female. So... Um, you know, if I if I had an issue where I, I was dealing with all slugs, I would go back in there and into the cages and just either a you know double check my temperatures, maybe recalibrate um, the the thermostat, which I, which happened to me. So one of the things that I try to do is um, like I'm on a journey and I'm still learning. I'm no like expert or pro right. or like that. Respect. So when I learn some new information, you know, I just try to share it with other people so that they don't make the same mistake that I make. And, um, and that way we could all learn together. Because <clears throat> I feel like the, the worst part about this is, you know, when people have some upsets and things don't work out perfectly, when, when you keep that information to yourself, maybe you're going through it, maybe there's like some shame or whatever it is, um, nobody learns from that. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that part sucks because somebody else is probably going to make the same mistake that, you know, that you made. So I just try to be um, as transparent as possible just so, you know, people can learn from my mistakes. Now, I try to take the same approach. Yeah, but just I think it's beneficial for everybody to see those mistakes. Yeah. Or not even, you know, some of them are mistakes. Some of them are just, bad you know, luck like you said, too. just random bad luck or, you know, something. Yeah. Probably a lot of the stuff with pairings comes down to just timing that we can't necessarily be 100% sure, sure about. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Ed had a, I asked Ed something about it. I can't remember what, what he, exactly he said about, you know, bad litters versus good litters, but essentially like, what was it? You can't, you, you can't, you can't do anything about, I'm going to mess it up. Basically saying you can't make a bad litter good, but you can't really do anything to ruin a good litter as well. Like you can make all the mistakes and, and if things were timed right, you'll still get a good litter in some cases, whereas you can do everything right. And still get a bad result if something's yeah. you know something out of your hands. So 
But of course, we still want to learn and try to correct mistakes that we, you know, that we can. Absolutely. And Marshall, what do you have to say on the slug topic, though? You know, I mean, I know you've been breeding emeralds for how long? How many years now? Like since 2013, you was your first pairing or, or before then? Uh, I can't, I can't remember if I had a pair of, uh, maybe a pair of crosses before, before that, but yeah, it was around that time. Um, all my animals are, or my first emeralds I got in like 06 or 07. So, uh, that's not true. I, I had a couple before, but the first ones that I got that ended up breeding, I got them in 06 or 07. That would have been, you know, seven years later. And, 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 and as far as, you know, you experiencing slugs from a lot of your pairings, I haven't, you know, I haven't gotten a ton of slugs. Um, this past one, this past litter was a few. Um, I can't remember exactly how many, um, but with the crosses, I definitely have gotten this one female has given me, uh, I think she's had four, four litters, two of which produced a few viable babies that, that lived and two of them were, uh, slugs. Mm. So she's not very fertile. I don't know if that's the cross cross thing or, or what, mm -hmm. what I've been, you know, pairing her with, um, have you used different males in those pairings or is always, I haven't, thing? I've only used one male, so I'm yeah. going to try a different male next time. Okay. I mean, could that also be something where like trying multiple males on a female could result into like the sperm not being as strong as it should, or maybe two sperms mixed in, like, isn't the ideal thing or like, <laughs> I'm just curious. Like well, if you can have a, if you can have, can you have a dual sired litter? I guess you, yeah, you can. Sure you can. Yeah. Well, pythons you can. So for mm -hmm. sure you, you, you can here, I would say. Right. Um, that's something that I was going to actually ask you, Alan, if you've done that and Marshall too, if you've ever done multiple males on one female, because I haven't tried that yet. No, I, I, I never have. That, and, I've, and I know it's common in boa breeding in general, but yeah. I've never, I've never tried that yet. I, I wouldn't, for me personally, I wouldn't do it because I want to know, I mean, who knows with, with um, genetic testing and everything else. I mean, there's, there's been so many more advancements you know, in the, in the, in the hobby that, you know, maybe we would be able to identify who the sire is, but me personally, at this stage, I wouldn't do that because I want to know exactly who the sire is, you know? That's, so yeah. that's I think the only I way I would do it is if I hadn't seen any, any copulations, you know, yeah, if the male was, was breeding or was breeding strong, I, I don't think I would, I know I wouldn't do it. Um, but if I just, you know, didn't want the female to go a year and not get anything from her, I might, try another male if there was no no action yeah now what's crazy is as you're you know boosting up numbers as far as pairings you do start to see some males are made for this shit and some males just fucking suck um and and and, and like you know you kind of have to be ready for that obviously um and and i want to say I, i've seen quite a bit of early action going on in the beginning of my pairings this year and then it you know i had the one female right here that ovulated and this girl right here looks like she's right behind, but definitely both males have stopped locking more than two weeks now. Um, well, they have, this male's pulled, but I'm talking about this one that, that's still paired right here. Um, and I'm kind of con not concerned, but I'm like, huh, I wonder if this is even going to go because the male is just like, he's just more interested in eating at this point, And he just doesn't, he's not smashing at all. So can we talk about when you guys are noticing male separation from the female and then when usually you're seeing ovulation or i mean is it usually right away uh where they ovulate after he stops showing interest is it a while whoever wants to go first on that i'll go first cool. so it, it really depends there's um uh, i've had you know breedings where i only put the male in there once and they locked up right away one time and then she ovulated you know shortly afterwards i think it was in, like within 40 days and they only had one copulation. So you don't, uh, I mean, it's better to, to, to keep on pairing them as frequently as possible, but sometimes you, you can get a litter just off of one copulation, just like yeah. with any other species too. Alan, why did you pull the male? I'm curious. Cause you know, you know, you know, you normally you leave that male in there until they ovulate. You said you got one lock and then was, was it that he just stopped after that or did you pull him after that? And then she ovulated. Great question. I'm, so I pulled him because I paired him up with um, two girls. Oh. And, and so what people, like you say with ball pythons, if you don't have an ultrasound machine, what people will do is they'll just, um, they'll pair a male to a female once a month. And so that was the strategy. So I paired him to one female um, and then 
he they locked. He was there for a week. Then I took him out. I put him back in his cage. I let him rest. I, I don't know. I can't remember if I offered him food or not because um, I feed my males um, maybe once every three weeks, once a month. And, and, um, and then I put him with the other female and then, you know, kind of rinse and repeat. I put him back into his own cage. And then surely, you know, sh soon enough, I just see her like kind of blowing up and you can't miss an ovulation just like on yours, you know, like wow. she's massive. But that's, that's all it was just one time. Yeah. Timing was just perfect. It seems yeah, like yeah, a situation was perfect. like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now also, you know, it's crazy, you know, being friends with people like Sock, like Sock will tell you, like sometimes I remember Sock telling me with this chondro pairing, I think it was the uh, white diamond Optimus Prime. Like yeah, he right. got he got one lock in too late or something like that because she was like mm. already too far in development or something like that. And like during the ovulation, he called me. He's like, dude, she ovulated, but she's gonna she's gonna give me slugs. I'm like, how the fuck you know she's gonna give you slugs? Like, and he told me, well, he locked her late and it was a small ovulation, but even I thought he was crazy, but he called it like she fucking slugged out. So I'm wondering, is you know, in, you know, like Chris, the timing was perfect, but could this also be a case where you put him in there too late and you know, like same scenario? Could that possibly be a thing that could be? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've certainly heard that, and, and I can see where that might happen if, if she's too far along in the process, and you put the mail in, and then you know, I don't, I don't, I haven't had that experience yet, at least not that I thought I had, because I start pairing them pretty early, and then you know, let them go for months. Um, what happens in that case that. if you don't put the mail in? Do you know? She re reabsorbs, right? Uh, she yeah, she should reabsorb. She yeah. But um, I've I, everything you know. I, I've I haven't had one of the situations yet where I had the one and done, and it was just everything was was timed perfectly. Everything I've done so far, I put them in and let them you know stay together for months. Um, I do separate the male and put him back in, especially if he's going between two females. Right. But um, yeah, I haven't had that that super fast you know situation like that. Now you you were talking about feeding. You know, I I don't know. It's crazy because I had. One boa litter, it wasn't an emerald, it was a boa constrictor. Um, what are the, the, the smaller ones? Or the BCI is not the smaller one, or Central American, right? Those are the smaller ones, right? Anyway, so I, I got advised that hey, if she wants to eat, feed her throughout the process. And I was like, what? I was like, I thought like ball pythons they shut off and they stop eating, but dude, sure enough, she was taking like a small rat like every two, three weeks, and I couldn't believe it. I also heard that's something that people could do with the with the emerald tree boas if they're eating as well. But I could tell you right now, she wants nothing to do with food. She's completely shut off. But how many times have you guys maybe experienced like a female down to eat while after ovulation and whatnot? Is that still common with the emerald tree boas? I haven't seen it. Yeah, me neither. Okay. I have. My, my female eats. Wow. I have two females. Does she refuse at any point and then go back? To eating or um, she just she just never stops so usually like going up to i want to say like the last 30 days then she'll stop but the wow. it's five months so um uh two females ate for the first four months and i just offer a real small meal right because they're developing so it might be a wean or as big as a small but that's it that might even be what it is. Now I haven't. I've gone from the um, approach of once they start refusing before ovulation, I just stop offering them food after that. Um, yeah, same. That's yeah. just the approach I've taken. But I'm I, this year I might try, you know, offering food. But I could see where, you know, I've seen when the females start refusing right before ovulation. I don't know if you guys have seen the same thing, but it looks like they're actually like sizing up the meal you offer, and they can tell like if you offer them something large, they're not gonna take it yeah. but i've had one that looked like she wasn't going to eat but i gave her a really small weaned rat and she took that huh. so hmm. i don't know if maybe maybe they are actually sizing it up and and they're only going to take something that's that's you know a small enough meal um but we'll see i, mean, I think i'm going to try that, that this could, year that could, assuming i get any ovulations and everything goes that can only help a female bounce back though you would think right like as far yeah. as like not being so like deflated and being drained of sure food, like, I, I i you would think that's one thing I've noticed is that it takes so much out of them. Like every time, even the successful litters that I've had, the female just looks like complete shit afterwards, just like a deflated balloon, you know, all like, uh, emaciated. Um, they've just not come out of it very well when there's been, you know, the, the big litters that I've had. Um, 
if they just lay slugs, then it's fine. Right. Uh, the female that I was talking about earlier, which I mean, she's not a basin. She's a, she's a cross, but, uh, same thing when she's given a, when she's given me a litter or just all slugs, she never, she never really got very, you know, she never really got as big. Um, and after she let, you know, she had them, she didn't look terrible, but the, the three, three basin litters, um, the moms looked really bad after after everyone, and the, the northern that I've uh, bred a couple times, she used to look really bad after, like the head all sunken in, and uh, just it, it seems to take a lot out of them. What does yeah. Ed say, Alan? Um, Ed says that some of them will eat. I think he told me that maybe anywhere between thirty and forty percent of them will still eat, but um, but no, I could be wrong. It's, no, it's it's worth me trying to offer something small. Is what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, sounds like it. Dude, she looks so big already. It's like God, but you know, look, look what she's doing inside of her. I mean, well, it, it, let ahead. me just stop you right there because you like, so they 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 swell up, right? They look like right. they swallowed a football, but right. then that swelling is gonna go back go back down. Right, so right. I wouldn't offer a meal when she's huge. Right, of course. Um, I would say, you know, wait maybe two, three weeks after the ovulation, and then you could offer. And she might not take it, but she might, you know. And if she does, then that's that's a bonus. However many meals you can get her to eat um, before she actually gives birth, the better, you know. You, I, I wouldn't overfeed them. Um, right. So if you're already on like every like a, every three week or every month schedule, I would just you know stay with that. Yeah, and also you would think. Keep you'd want stuff that to pass very easily. Obviously, you don't want to have any clog or block blockage because that right there could lead into a lot of issues. I would think so. That's why I would think if if you get them to eat anything, have them something small like you know, obviously a wean rat seems perfect. You know, compared yeah. to a goddamn large like what she eats. You know, so yeah. uh, a wean would probably just slurp down like nothing. You know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But a little um, extra sustenance. You know, I could see where. If they'll take it and it's not causing problems, I'd heard mixed opinion of it. I, the reason I haven't done it yet is just because I know the the I was kind of basing it on what uh, Vin Russo does with boas and right. approach it like you know they they wouldn't do that and they most likely wouldn't eat in the wild, so they're designed to kind of do that gestation without the without food. But if a female will take a small meal and she's handling it fine, then it's probably not you know not an issue as long as you don't overdo it. Yeah, I, I think it'd be a good good thing. Yeah, I think so. Now, you know, obviously there's a lot of people out there who have different look outlooks as far as, you know, re, you know, having a, a repeat pairing go down. Some people want to wait a year, some people wait even 2 years. Do I even have a homie shout out to Casper out there in the Netherlands who even thinks 2 years isn't even enough. Like and and I and he's just basing that off of results from the, you know, the uh the proven female that he's had. So I'm I'm curious with you guys, when do you feel like is you know, let's just say you get a female to have a successful litter, and let's say it's to say it's a good size one. Let's, well, what's the ideal break you feel like is going to be for that female, just to avoid any complications in the in the long run, based off all your guys' experience doing it so far. Um, Go say, ahead. Go ahead. I would say at least two years, um, but the longer you wait, the better. You know, if you, yeah. if you, because the idea is if if you want to at least get her back to the same size that she was um, before the, the, the prior litter. But if you can get her to a bigger size, then it's possible that you might have a, a, a bigger litter. But I wouldn't breed her again until she was at least the size that she was before she had, you know, the, the, the last litter. So and by doing, by you, keeping track of that you i'm assuming you weigh your girls do you like to weigh your girls alan or how do you like to keep track as far as like making sure they're back to size or or is it just visual just visual yeah at this point you know i don't really want to disturb them the only time that i will weigh them is if is if like let's say they one of them breaks down with like a respiratory infection and then oh, you know way. yeah and then we need to medicate them and you got to figure out the proper dosage but other than that, you know, it's just, it's all like eyeballs, you know? And then I also kind of look at, like I weigh out the, the rats that I feed. So, you know, if if I look on the chart and I feel like we've taken down a certain size, then, um, and she looks like she's the same size as she was before, because, you know, 
with technology, I mean, we all have phones, right? We're taking pictures. I'm, I'm sure you guys have like hundreds of pictures, you know, on your phone. Thousands. Right? I got thousands, bro. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, right? So you know, you know for sure, you know, oh, like last year around this time, the snake was, it looked like this, you know? Um, so you could kind of eyeball it, you know? Um, I, there are certain people I would imagine that might be precise like that and, and weigh it. But after talking to Ed about like what he does, I feel like, man, none of that is, is not necessary, you know? Right. And what do you think on that, Chris? Cause Chris, you're, you're pretty like, you know, I, I feel like you do more than the usual keeper as far as stuff that you pay attention to. Cause you're, you know, I talking to you, I learn a lot. Right. But you know, what, what, what's your take as far as when you think it's necessary to weigh uh, like a, a, an adult Emerald tree boa? Um, well, I would say, I would agree with Alan. If, if, at this point, I never weigh them anymore. I originally, you know, a few years ago, I was weighing the chondros and emeralds more and getting more nerdy with it. But more than likely, just laziness sets in as you get more animals and you're like, oh, do I really want to, you know, take this one out and weigh this? And, you know, I already do a decent amount of record keeping. Right. So I'm, I'm the same way in that I do everything pretty much visually. Um, you would want to weigh it if you're doing medication. Um, I could see where, I mean, there probably are patterns and I'm sure there's useful information to be gleaned from doing that. I just don't feel like, I'm going to get enough benefit from it to, to, you know, for it to really matter that much. I think, you know, the uh, visually telling whether the animal's uh, body condition is ready for, for breeding is, is enough in my experience. Nothing puts me in a bad mood more than having to call Socrates for advice. And he tells me, give it four Taz. When he tells me, give it four Taz, my heart, I, I hate that shit. Like I hate having to medicate any kind of snake because it's fucking sucks right we also don't know the future of the snake either and i had you know the one that girl that just passed away man um r.i.p uh jessica alba but when i first got her in i think marshall remember i shared her a lot in the beginning and she had like that always had that mouthing and and i was trying to figure out what was going on took her multiple vet visits uh just dosages after after dosage with fortas she finally kicked it um but like man like i i I, I know that there's a time and place where you have to medicate some of these animals, but from what I understand, speaking of Socrates, when you have a female that's ovulated or in that, in that, in that process, giving medication is almost certain death for that entire litter from what I heard. Um, and, and I don't know what I, you I guys experience. Yeah. I don't know what your guys experiences with any of that. Alan, I don't know if you could talk on that and, and, and what your experiences with medicating a female that's already like ovulating and, and, and whatnot but you know that that kind of stuff freaks me out you know what i mean yeah i mean it's tough right these are at the end of the day these are all animals and you know we're trying to intervene as much as possible you know yeah. to save them right because sometimes animals just like humans get sick and yep. the, the 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 beef that i have and this isn't beef with any vet or anything like that but these um uh, even these the medicines that we give that the, the vet provides they're not designed for reptiles, right? right? Like we're, you know, reptiles, right? Cold-blooded animals, we're warm-blooded. A lot of the, 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 the antibiotics that we receive from the vet, those were designed and made for cold-blooded animals, you know, or warm-blooded warm animals. So um, I wish that there was something that was really more, you know, reptile-specific. Now, do they work? I mean, they do, they do work. Sometimes, but, yeah. Like, I think that there will be better, in, like as technology advances, um, the medical field, you know, the veterinarian field, I, th I think that we will have better tools um, to treat them. Yeah. And Marshall, you know, you've obviously dealt with medicating or right as far as having to do that when needed. Yeah. Everything. Emeralds, chondros, ball pythons. I've had to give shots to all of them for, you know, you it's been a res respiratory infections uh, every time in all three species. But uh, the one emerald that I had, I remember his his RI was so bad before because they're really good at hiding it. Like right. you'll, you know, other than you'll see the mouth, you know, if they if they mouth gape or whatever, if their mouth, you know, kind of uh, breathe open mouth. That's one sign, although. I'll say I have several basins here that do that almost all the time. And one of them that's done it since she was a baby and she doesn't have a respiratory infection. So maybe she's got something else going on, but she's been doing it ever since she was a baby and it doesn't uh, seem to affect her at all. But um, so 
anyway, where I was going with that is the, the, the one snake that I have treated, um, when I had my vet had come over and she, uh, I, luckily I have a vet real close by and she'll make house calls. And, um, so we took, we took him out and when he, we lowered his head down like liquid almost just like poured out of his, you know, poured out of his nose, um, is how bad his, you know, his, his respiratory had gotten. And, um, I'm pretty sure we gave him a round of, uh, amicacin and, um, man, he, he cleared right up and he lived for, he's still alive. Nice. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've, I've, I've also had, you know, experiences where it, you know, the emerald, the, the boa turned around. I remember my mail, I had two males that got hit with the, uh, we got hit with RI because how dry my room got, you know, and, and luckily, you know, it was a good experience, you know, bouncing them back. Um, I just hear it's like with more of the female being gravid already and them, you know, a female getting an, a, a respiratory infection when she's already, you know, about to go the distance. You know what I mean? Um, that would that's be tricky. A, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't, what would you I do? I haven't, you haven't know? dealt with that, but has anybody, any, any of you guys dealt with that before? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have. Okay. So, Batril and Fortez... Because I, I think Batril and, and Fortaz is the same thing. That's a really strong antibiotic. Yeah. So um, yeah, once you start once you start giving them the, the the treatment for that, especially if they are gravid or they've already ovulated, then you might as well just count the litter out. I mean, it's possible that you could still get a viable litter, but I wouldn't go into it thinking that. I would think that oh, you know what? Hopefully, I could save this female. The female survives. Because the, wor the worst thing that could happen is not losing the litter. The worst thing that could happen is losing the female. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's happened to me. So, like, I, I have, I've lost females, you know, during, you know, after ovulation for a few different reasons. And what, I, what I've been doing is just trying to learn from that and then also trying to educate people about what I've seen so that hopefully if they see these signs – you know they could um, they could change you know change their course of action and um, and save the female ultimately. Well, let's let's kind of talk about some of these signs, bro. I mean, like first and foremost, the females that you lost after ovulation, like how how soon after ovulation did it did they start showing uh, maybe signs that they you know something was up with them? So one female, kind of like what exactly exactly what we're talking about, she ovulated and she broke down with a respiratory infection. Right. And right, like right away, right away, Alan. Like right, like right when she ovulated, she broke down, or when when did that happen? Yeah, yeah like I would say within days after ovulating. So she swelled. She was, you know, she sw swelled up after the ovulation process, and then um, and then I noticed just like what Marshall was saying, they'll open their mouth and they just kind of breathe out of their mouth because their nose is clogged, and then also you'll start seeing bubbles around the nose, and there's a there's a lot of reasons that snakes will get a uh, respiratory infection, right? So sometimes they can get it from another snake. So if they were in close contact, um, uh, that could be it. There could be, you can get a respiratory infection from too much humidity. Like, so if you, if you have that hot stagnant air and it's not circulating, if your humidity dries, runs, you know, runs too low and your cage is too dry, they can get a respiratory infection that way. Um, I mean, um, unfortunately, it does happen. And so for that particular female, um, which was, her name was Betty White. All right, Betty White. But, um, but she, uh, she ovulated and then uh, she ovulated. Then I noticed that she started having a kind of the mucus by her nose. So I brought her to the vet. Uh, the vet recommended um, amicacin, which is another, it's a strong antibiotic, but it's not as strong as the Fortaz and the Batril. And, um, and she was a loner, um, you know, just like that. And I was treating her. So the way it works with vets is you go to the vet, they'll tell you what medication they feel is best. Uh, the best way that you could do this is by getting a culture. Um, so I had a, a culture done recently with, um, with a ball python. And what we found out was, so basically what they'll do when you get a culture for the people that are not familiar with this, is they'll take some of the saliva and they'll put it into a petri dish. And then what they'll do is they'll add um, different types of uh, medicines into that petri dish to see which type of medicine 
um, is resistant to that particular ba bacteria that causes the respiratory infection. Because there's a lot of different types of bacteria and a lot of different types of viruses that, um, that the snake can get that will ultimately cause that respiratory infection. And the respiratory infection is basically like, um, almost like pneumonia, right? You have just a lot of mucus with inside the lungs. So it's hard for the snakes to breathe. And then sometimes that mucus will travel up to the throat. That's why if you see a snake um, with like, let's say snot or like a little bit of drool, if you, if you get close to the snake and maybe the snake, I'm gonna put, this is a, this is a fake snake, right? <laughs> but if, if you have this snake and you, know, you, you bring it close to your ear, sometimes you can hear a crackling noise and that's just the air trying to penetrate through all that mucus, right? So, um, wow. you know, when all, when, all of that, when all of that happens, you know, the, the snake is just struggling. And, you know, they, they, um, the, the, the different bacteria respond differently to different antibiotics. That's why there's just not one and done. There's a lot of different types of antibiotics to treat a lot of different types of bacteria. The problem is, is that as our, uh, and this goes with humans as well, like as we, you know, travel more and we, we get more exposed to different types of like germs and bugs, um, we could develop certain types of intolerances, but also the bugs become stronger and you could have like super bugs where normally you would treat like with penicillin or another type of antibiotic, but that antibiotic that we normally use is now resistant. So the same thing is true with snakes. So the best course of action is to go to the vet, get a culture sample done so they could find out which antibiotic is best to treat it. So a lot of times, you know, when you go to a vet, you know, that process takes week, uh, it, it takes sometimes like a week, right? For you to get the result back from the culture. It could even take longer depending on um, how fast and how connected that vet is and who they deal with. But, you know, we don't really have a week, right? So what they'll normally do is say, all right, this is a, your snake is showing signs of a respiratory infection. We're gonna give you a really strong antibiotic because these antibiotics kill most bacteria, like most of the bad viruses and things like that. Um, so that's good because most of the time they are, um, they, they are affected, but sometimes they're ineffective. So when you get a culture done, you could know exactly which antibiotic you should be taking. Because if you're just, you know, if you're just using one of the strong ones like Fortas, that might be overkill. There might be a, a milder antibiotic that is targeted directly towards that bacteria and it's not gonna have such an effect on that snake. And, um, and that could be a game changer, right? Because like what we're saying, if, if you're dealing with a snake that's already rabid, right? She already has a belly full of babies the last thing that you want to do is just drop a bomb into her system um, because that's going to hurt her, right? Because what, the, what it does is not only does it kill the bad bacteria, but it also kills the good bacteria, right? So <clears throat> inside your, your snake's intestines, they, just like humans, they have a microbiome with plenty of like good and bad. And the, what you need to do is make sure that it's all in balance. So when you go and you hit it with an antibiotic that's just too strong, you know, you're going to kill some of the good stuff too. So first step is... And I don't, What's up? I, I don't know if it's just the uh, the mixture that my vet, the way she mixes it, um, but the dosage is so tiny. It's yeah. like, it's, it's like, uh, yeah, it's in like a little, I like a, a, a diabetic syringe, like an insulin yeah. syringe, which has, you know, yeah. it's like the whole thing is, I don't know, one ML maybe. Probably and I don't know how the size is. Yeah. Yeah, and you're given the doses like 0 0.02 ml for the size of the snake. So, I mean, it's just yeah. like the first two tick marks on a little yeah. tiny syringe. That's the dosage for it. And I'm just I'm just sitting here thinking about it and just talking that out. I wonder why you can't just mix it a little bit weaker so that you don't have to be so precise. Because, I mean, you could overdo it just a little bit uh, when the dose is that small. And yeah. from what the vet was telling me, it like really taxes the the kidneys. Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard on the body. Um, and I'm not sure if there's any benefit, like if they could dilute it or not. I know that with certain antibiotics, um, it's it's not as concentrated. Um, so for for some of the weaker ones, 
um, you will get, um, it might be, instead of like say 0 0.01 mils, it might be like, you know, one mil. Sometimes certain medications are like, let's say one mil for every uh, kilogram, so every thousand yeah. grams that the snake is. Um, but I don't know why it's so concentrated and I don't know if there's a way that they could make it diluted. I don't know um, because it's some some things are water sol soluble and some things are um, are fat soluble, and I don't I don't know like I don't know if that's one of those things where you could just add like a drip of water to it to to, to make it less concentrated even though they're getting the same dose, or you know there's another way around it. But hopefully, as as the technology improves, uh, we will be able to solve some of those problems, and then you know, um, we will like lose less animals due to sicknesses like respiratory infections and things like that. So I'm very hopeful for the future. Yeah. I would imagine too, probably, um, you know, some of the dosaging is, is based off of warm blooded animals as well. Like, yeah, or like you were saying, good. it's, it's not probably quite as tailored to, to exotics yet as, as we'd like it to be, but yeah. over time, hopefully we'll get there. Yeah. I hope so. I really yeah. Um, you know, one of the things too, that I, it's unfortunate, but like when you have a little bit of success going your way, as far as with a pair uh, of snakes or whatever, you start to get advice from people that like give you little like tidbits of what you could do to make the snakes more process, more comfortable. Right. And, you know, I, I went, I talked to Chris about this recently, as far as like, you know, I have two perches here for my gravid female, but I noticed as she was going through it. I was like, dude, she looks like she can like use a ledge or something. Like she, like it, like she's hanging and like she was using the other perch, but like I'm like, dude, should I put another perch in there? And like, and, and now I'm really thinking and considering at least putting more options for to the, for them to rest their body. And I'm just curious what your guys' thoughts is on that. Like, um, you know, can that maybe have to do with sometimes females not be able to pass some of the litters because. They're not be able to get their body to a certain like think about like monitors, right? Like I've been geeking out hardcore about lace monitors. I have them paired up and whatnot. And one of the things I'm reading about is like lace monitors, females, once they ovulate or once they get to the point, they need like a, a diagonal like position to like put their body in a sense where they're not pressuring so much. But like and it's weird because, it, you know, they they just recommend having ledges that where they could do that if they wanted to. Right. But I'm curious. I'm like, do that. That, that might have to be something for these snakes that have huge ovulations and whatnot. And, and I don't know, I'm going to think about maybe adding more stuff and wondering what your guys' thoughts is on that. I think so. Um, that's, that's, you know, I, I have a lot of crisscrossed branches and, and, and the, uh, cages in general, but particularly when the females are gravid, I mean, they'll, they'll make use of all that stuff, you know, anything where they can kind of, you know, through on any given part of a day, whether they're basking or they're resting, you know, especially when they're basking, though, they'll do all sorts of weird pretzel positions, you know what I mean, trying to get comfortable um, and distribute that weight better. And, and during ovulation, I think, is, as well, it, it helps. Um, I actually got an interesting comment from somebody on um, a YouTube video of mine the other day. It said they're in Brazil, and I, I, I haven't heard back from him yet, but he made a comment about, seemed like he was saying the, the females that he's observed in the wild in Brazil use like like use root systems like really thick um you know logs and branches to um you know when they're ovulating but i don't know if he meant just during that ovulation process i don't know if he meant you know throughout while they're uh their gestation or whatever but i think the more support you can give them the better and then they'll use it as they need it yeah i agree with that the, it's um you know they need variety for sure one of the, the tips that Ed told me that he does is when a female is struggling and she's really big, he'll put a tub inside the cage and he'll flip it over and they'll rest flat on the tub. Wow. So you should, I agree with Chris, you should have crisscrosses in there, like crisscross branches. You, like you don't well, want to- That's probably either. not a bad idea, honestly. Yeah, you don't want to just put like a straight pole going inside the cage and then that's all they have, right? Like that that's not supportive enough um, because they are cooking these babies. I mean, it's a bun in the oven for sure. And they really rely on temperatures. And that's something else that I learned. If you keep your temperatures too low, then that's going to prolong the gestation. And that that doesn't help anyone. 
you know, that, that, that doesn't help the snake at all, you know? So, um, and th that's one of the tips that I had to learn, right? So I have my cages all set up, you know, everything is good. Yeah, I, I made sure that the probes were placed correctly. Um, and I had these cages all in line for years. So like, it was like plug and play, I never touched it again. And then what I found out was, um, so I boosted the temperature under the radiant heat panel so that the, the female can bask and warm up. But for some reason, it wasn't calibrated. So it said that it was reading at 92 degrees. And I thought everything was fine. Uh, but then as the, as the pregnancy was like, you know, drawn out for so long, what I did was I got my temp gun and I started tempered, like uh, probing, the, um, probing the perch under where the radiant heat panel is and it wasn't getting to the desired temperature. It was reading it as 92, but it was, it was never getting it to 92. Um, so that was just, you know, like an error on my part. So now I make sure that I, I just double check it periodically. You know, you don't gotta do it all the time, but you know, at, at least if you have a gravid female, you just wanna make sure that the, the, the temperatures are reading correctly. So it was just a matter of kind of opening up the, the I mean, um, going into the settings inside of the, 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 the thermostat and then just changing the calibration and then just um, making it more aligned. So what I did was I used my temp gun and I just probed to find out what the temperature is and I just adjusted it from there. And little tweaks like that, I mean, it goes a long way, like a long, long way. And um, I'm trying to think the results of that letter. Um, I think I ended up losing that female. Damn. Because her, her gestation was just so long. Actually, no, 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 I didn't lose her. Um, I had to bring her to the event and I induced her. Wow. We were, yeah, so a, a, few, a typical a gestation is gonna be around 150 days. It could be as soon as 130 and it can go as long as 180. And I know people who said that they've, um, they went to, I think it was like, low 200s. I think uh, my friend Keith had one low 200s, but I, I think he may have been counting um, the, 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 the post ovulation shed. But, um, but anyways, if you're not getting the temperatures up, you know, then it's going to draw out for so long and that's just going to like, it's going to tax the female even more. So we induced her and um, uh, so she went into labor, she gave birth I think we were on day like 190 or 190 something, and the babies were still premature. Damn. Damn. They still, weren't, they still weren't ready. Still weren't wow. ready. Mm -hmm. Still weren't ready. And she looked like, you know, like Marshall said, I mean, like, the, yeah. the, the pregnancy lasts for so long that the, the females, like, it tax them so much that they, after they give birth, I mean, they're really emaciated. Like, you can see their ribs. You know, um, emeralds have like fat storages on top of their head. Like if you see this one right here, yeah, there's um, like these just big, big uh, lobes. And those yeah, are I, I call them butt heads, man. They got, they got booty heads. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they look like booties. And um, they were, it was just completely like it was flat. It was flatter than Taylor Swift. I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> man, um... Okay, but you know, kind of going back though, you know, I, one thing that I feel like is overlooked, and this is coming from, like, man, I learned a, hard, a lot of hard lessons, and it is what it is. Some people learn lessons as they come, and 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 probe settings, man, where you set your probes is everything. I feel like, um, because you know, you, you a lot of people at first just feel like reading what the probe says is kind of what you need to go with, but if you don't have a temp gun, you're you're you you really are fucking yourself big time. Because you yeah. need you need some sort of like confirmation that the temps are reading what they need to be reading, like you're saying. Um, so first and foremost, Alan, where do you keep your probes? Uh, I keep them under the radiant heat panel, like directly under, or like touching, or like where at? No, so they're um, they're probably f they're about four inches under the radiant heat panel, and they're maybe like a, an inch above the the perch. Okay, and and that's where you have it set for ninety two. Or, so it's only 92 when they're uh, when they're grabbing. Other than that, I'll just keep it at like 86, um, um, just because my room is already 84 degrees. You know, yeah, 82 to 84 it fluctuates. So um, 
if I notice that like a snake is always on the warm side, then maybe I'll come in and I'll adjust it and I'll put the cage a little bit warmer. But um, th that temperature is like an ideal range for me and what I've experienced. But during the, the during, when they're gravid, you do want to um, you do want to bump up the temperatures. Yeah, and, and and what's your nighttime temp preference then when when it comes to a gravid female, like in the in the in the in the heat panel. So I I, um, I dropped the nighttime temperature to the same temperature, so it will be seventy eight degrees. Seventy eight. So they don't really get heat at night. Okay. Okay. So it's basically whatever it is in the room. Yeah. Yeah. But but then again, it's also seventy eight, which is nothing. I mean, that's that's warm. I would still yeah. say in a sense. Because Marshall runs his room natural, right, as far as ambient, right? Because Marshall, I've been in your room and it's been down to like the I would say like the low seventies. I remember the coldest I think I've been yeah. in, here, right? And and it's only like that obviously during the winter, right? Yeah, just during the winter and just at night, I shut off all the heat except for like baby racks, right. um, all the adult cages, all the heat panels shut off at night, and it gets down to ambient room temp. So yeah can get to six you know uh it stays around 73 usually but if we have like a really cold night outside like if it's you know 20 degrees or, or real far below freezing it'll get down into 68 69 maybe you know the lower cages in the room um that's not very often though right uh, but 73 is pretty pretty regular during the winter and obviously, I love how Chris runs it because he's very unique. You know, it's, he's sol solely ambient. Or remind me how you really get your fe gravid females, they're basking when they need it, Chris. You, it's really cool. Can you break that down again? Yeah. Well, so I've got two. I've got. I've been experimenting with a bunch of different stuff over the last few years. But the, the setup that I'm most happy with that I've done the last few seasons is um, actually not this room. It's another room that I have them in. And that room is a small kind of extra sunroom style thing. And there's windows, uh, a lot of windows. So I basically let the natural sunlight warm the room and also create the basking spots for the females. So the oh, that's so cool. Their, their temperature follows really, really closely what's going on outside. It's just kind of, uh, it's basically just a little bit uh, tamed down from that. So it's usually a few degrees um, below whatever's going on outside. Uh, and Where are you? Where are you located? Uh, I'm in Central Florida, so I, I've got okay. the advantage of, you know, most of the year I don't have to do anything. To, um, I, I, it's a little, it would probably give a lot of people, uh, you know, kind of a fit to, to let the temperatures go as wild as they do. But I just let it f go exactly like whatever's going on outside. So it'll peak ambient during the day, the hottest uh, months of the summer. Um, the ambient will be maybe 90, 91 in there for a few hours. Um, and then the basking spot that, you know, from the, from the sun, um, can get up, I, I've clocked the females around 95, 96, uh, for a few hours, but it's a gradual ramp up and gradual ramp down throughout the yeah. day. Uh, but every day is different too. It's, it's literally whatever is, it's based on whatever's going on outside. Um, the only time I have to do any external heat is during the winter. Um, I have a, just a little small space in heater in there just to keep it from going below 70, um, and then keep it you know, on the coldest days to keep it going up to at least 80 or 81, uh, ambient. And, um, it's worked out really well. Like it's, I, it's not something I think you could do everywhere. And I basically oh, based no. it off of, <laughs> yeah, but you couldn't do it in a lot of other areas, it, at least not the way that I'm doing it. No, um, yeah. but at the same time, it's not, it's not that different from like what you're doing, Alan, in the sense that for the most part, you know, except for the hottest days, most of the year, the ambience getting up into the you know mid 80s so it's you know 84 85 86 something like that um maybe it'll peak 87 88 on a, on a spring day or something and then it comes back down and then the you know high 70s at night so it's pretty close to to like what you're doing as far as the ambient contr uh, controlled room there um the big difference is just that there's a lot more swing in terms of the you know day-to-day -day, uh, overall ambient and then the basking spot thing is is pretty interesting to watch and those females that i've that i've let have litters back there they you know when that sunlight comes through and hits the cage uh, and creates a little basking spot they'll always you know once they're grab it anyways they go over there they lay uh sprawl out they'll bask for anywhere from an hour to three or four hours at the most and then it's, it's like in a glass cage. cage or what kind of cage is it uh it's like these these old school acrylic cages so it's polycarbonate 
Okay. And, um, so it, it warms up. I've got, I've posted a video of it recently on my Instagram, but it basically creates that sunspot for a few hours. They'll bask under there for, for a little while and then they move off of it. And the closer they get to, um, delivery, the less often they're basking, you know, they're only go, they'll only do it for an hour or two and then move away from it. And then that seems to work pretty well. And I'm assuming that's pretty close to what they would be doing in the wild. Um, you know what I mean? They, they, and they probably could get even higher than I let them. Honestly, if it was directly outside basking, they probably would get, you know, I would imagine they'd, they'd be a little hotter than that and yeah. maybe just do a briefer, you know, or a more brief, uh, basking period. Yeah. You know, cause if you really think about it, I mean, yeah, I'm sure there's been some sort of studies, but how do we really know like what the preferred temperature is for a gravid female in the wild? If she could just blatantly have an opportunity to go right exposed under the sun I mean, that's going to directly, man, I mean, that's going to be over 100 degrees. You know what I'm saying? Um, and maybe they don't do it for long, but maybe they do it for like enough where they're like, all right, that's all I need. And then they go back. And, and how do we, hey, we there's just like so many things, you know, things that could go into it when we think about it, you know, because think about the blazing fucking sun out and where they're from when it's peak hot. Like, holy shit, it gets super hot. If you're not underneath the shade, you're, you're cooking. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and well, and, and they probably bask in different manners too in the wild. I would imagine they're they're probably in some cases doing that cryptic basking, where they're just letting you know a little small part of their body out into the you know right. into the okay. sun. They're not necessarily exposing their whole Everything, their whole yeah. yeah midsection. It's been interesting because keeping you know both males and females back there for the last few years and watching what they do. For the most part, they don't ever the females as well. They don't seem to have a whole lot of interest in basking you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, they're just content with whatever the ambient uh, temperature is. Yeah. But as soon as they ovulate, it's like clockwork every single day. They do the exact same pattern. They go, they bask, you know, charge up like a battery, move to the, away from the basking spot and then just sit comfortably for the rest of the day. Alan, what, how many hours do you like to provide basking for your, your room? Like for the snakes? Um, so when when they grab it, I, I I put them on an eight hour schedule, like with okay. uh, where it gets warm. Chris, man, I love that idea. Like I love that um, that you could, you have those options of like taking advantage of the environment, right? Because Central Florida, the the the, the climate is going to be similar, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, different areas of South America, right? So um, that that that's cool. I mean, I. The the one question I have for you about your cages is I know you said that it's polycarbonate. Did you build them out yourself or did you have those made? No, these are the old school like Ed and Tony and all that. I actually got these from a guy that used to. He says he sold some of his original snakes to Ed and Tony. Um, wow. I'm trying to remember what his name was. I think his name was Dave Toro. And so he. I remember I, that name. Yeah. He well, wow. yeah. He said he knew all the guys back in the day. He used to breed them. He ha he sent me pictures of a really badass northern that I think was named Bolts that looked. I don't. Yeah, the, like, wonder if that was the new new locality. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It had that. It's had the the Willie line look. It was you know huge white bands Sick. and really dope yeah. animal. And um, yeah, when I lived in Florida uh, for two or three breeding seasons, I left the windows in the room open all the time. Mm-hmm. And didn't do yeah, any do, supplemental heat. It was yeah, that was nice. Yeah, I do the same thing to let air. You know, I don't use a lot of fans because I'll, I'll just open the windows or you know even open the back door for a little while and let let uh, air circulate like that. But um, I wonder how they would do like outdoors and screen cages in the summertime. They would That's do great. Fun. I've I've kept them. I've kept. Um, I was quarantined. You know, I still do. I quarantine, not in screen cages in tubs, but I like put a million oh. ventilation holes in there to where it's like a, you know, it looks like a cheese grater. Basically <laughs> there's so many ventilation holes in there and I've kept them like that for a few seasons and um, they do really well. And they, they handle the just like out on your porch or something. Yeah. Well, yeah. I have a separate building that I keep them in and I've kept them. I actually did. Uh, it's crazy as it sounds. I quarantined one just on my carport for several months, uh, you know, dead summer. And, and it was, you know, I, I temp gunned it in the 95, 96. I think the highest was actually probably 98. I checked on it one day and I was freaked out thinking that that's going to cook them. But, you know, they, they handle that natural ambient warmth a lot different than an external heater. Um, right. You know, they, they're, they're not, they're not hanging loose on the perch when it's uh, natural ambient warmth like that versus, um, you know, if it's. Plus it had been down into the seventies the night before, probably. Well, that's the other thing about it. Yeah. They're not, they're not 
it, you know, they're not at those sustained temperatures for long periods of time. So they're getting that natural kind of uh, cycle of, you know, at least dipping down into the high 70s. Um, I let them get pretty cold as well on, on some of those nights, um, the ones that are outside in quarantine anyways. And, I've you know, if mid 50s, they've gone as low as that. Um, but usually it's more like, you know, low 70s, uh, high 60s. So you guys, you guys, all, you guys, nights, it gets down there. You guys all know who Ron St. Pierre is, right? Yeah, yeah, I was just gonna say him. Yes, yeah. well, check this out. This is how he keeps all his stuff outside. I think it's over, over forty emeralds. I think he has. I could be wrong on that number, but he keeps them fully outside, just like this. Um, and where straight. is he? He's in Florida. He's in more north, north Florida. I think, right? Is he northern of you, uh, Chris? That you know? I think so. Yeah. Okay. I thought he was in Central Florida too. No. Maybe Central or some some part. I know he's not in South Florida, but he's more of the upper part of Florida, from yeah. what I remember. But yeah, it's it's like the stuff you could get away with in a climate like Florida. It's ridiculous, and you know it's almost how people keep monitors outside and how much yeah. you see, how much you see that because monitors show you more, right? Like you know their demeanor and everything. And boy, do I love seeing a monitor just bask under the sun. It's probably one of the coolest things ever, and they and they prefer it. You would think, you know what I mean? The guy in Australia that does the chondros like that. I think he does yeah. green tree monitors too. But yep. that guy's sick. Yeah, well, there's awesome. a few I people. Yeah. Are, are, are you talking about? Um, is it? I think it's Aaron Hopper. Is it grass is greener? Aaron, yeah, yeah, grass is greener. Yeah, yeah. His setups are dope. That. Yeah. Him and then Michael Cermak in Australia. He's retired now, but he was a chondro breeder. And when I first started getting back into keeping, one of the you know when I started you know google going crazy google and shit and, and oh i think i've seen his stuff. setup before yeah it was like he's all got, outdoors like screen cages that's yeah that's what yeah that and then the guy that that had i had this snake uh, a northern an old old northern named mayamara that passed away a few years ago but when i picked that snake up that guy had been kept keeping her in an outdoor you know in a big screen cage that he built he kept that snake for 15 i think going on 16 years just no external heat, no spring, no nothing. He just would put the he had the screen cage on the back porch, didn't do anything for you know, the snake lived a long, healthy life. And it got me really thinking about that. It's like between seeing that and what and what Michael Cermak was doing in Australia, it's like, you know, this is something I should be able to do in this area, at least pretty close to that. And so it's it's definitely um, you know, been an interesting experience to watch that and, and, and see how you can do it. But um I wish Maya Mara would have lived longer, but she was already pretty old. She was <laughs> somewhere 20, 25 years old, something like that. It, the a green on a snake like that is just probably why I love emeralds so much. Cause mm -hmm. it's just not that type. And obviously basins have like, they, they come in more of that different different differentiations between darkness and lightness. Um, they and, and really, really rich green. On, yeah. On the oh, it's yeah. Awesome. And, and you know, I love the northerners. Don't get me wrong, but when it comes to just looking neck and neck between the two, oh, there's just no comparisons. I'm sorry, it's there's just something with the scalation and just it's just you could just tell like it's just more of a unique fucking specimen. And 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 and, and, and unless we're talking about a, like a, I mean, obviously there's northerners that could even pass for basins. I've even had some people think some really high like pattern bolted fucking northerns were coming off as basins when they're not. Uh, but you know what a unique snake is when it comes to that dark green uh, emerald that you had, Chris, because I had one too. And, yeah, yeah. and and you almost think like, will I ever have something like that again? And 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 I, who knows? But well, part of it's age too. It so is you, age. You will. Yes, part of it is age. You know, yes. which is um, so yes. You know, if they live long, you'll you'll have some. But at, at the same time, I do think you know there's ones that are even more special that have this that really really nice, you know, rich. Uh, the one you had, and then Myanmar as well. It, it, it looked closer to what you'll see on some basins, you right? Know, compared to what you'll see with with a lot of the northerns. Yeah, and so speaking of that, let's kind of tap in what's happening with the exact pairings and actual like documentations of the basins you currently keep, Alan, and you've been raising up. You know, from what I understand, it's mostly Ed Marino stock, um, and maybe a couple Steve Volk or one. I mean, why don't you break that all down for us and and then tell us what's happening this year with your pairings. Sure. So, um, so yeah, I try to buy as many basins from um, different people as possible just so I can diversify the bloodline because uh, basins, they stopped importing basins in the early 2000s. So what we have is what we have. You know, that's, that's the downside 
of like working with this species, right? Because even with green tree pythons, there's still more wild caughts coming in. And, you know, wild caughts are not for like the weak, right? You really got to know what you're doing. But as they still come in, you, you're still getting brand new bloodlines and there's new opportunities for, for things that you, we've never seen before, right? Like say example, you know, even um, the albino green trees, uh, which is so cool. But with basins, what we have is what we have. So I bought some from Steve Volk. I bought a couple from Marshall from that, two, that 2013 litter. Um, I, I bought some from um, Ed. And then the HQ Stripe actually came in from Germany. Um, so, you know, I just try to diversify as much as possible. But unfortunately, like over time, you know, um, I lost a few animals, which the sad part is, you know, um, you lose the bloodline. Right. And, you know, you can't get that back. There's no coming back once the once the animal passes away. But most of my bloodline now are, um, are from Ed, Ed Stock. And then all of my recent pickups were all from Ed, too. Um, but now what I'm trying to do is like uh, Ed, uh, uh, basins come in a variety of patterns. Right. You have um, textbooks, you have diamonds, you have snowflakes, you have frosted, you have. Uh, barbed wire. Yeah, barbed wire. Alien. And, what's that? Alien. And then the alien. Yeah. And lately, what I've been trying to do is just concentrate more on that alien pattern uh, because I really like it. I feel like that's what stands out to me most. Yeah. And when you are working with alien, the alien pattern, you're going to produce barbed wires, you're going to produce snowflakes, you're going to produce frosted um, animals. Uh, because it's all, you know, um, it's all like connected. And I have my theories of like why I think that, uh, but we just, it hasn't been pro proven out yet. So these are just theories essentially. But, um, but that's where my collection is now. So, so now I, I, um, I got rid of a few animals just so I could focus more on the, uh, the alien pattern projects. Man, and, and, and a lot of the alien stuff only became available within the last year or so, right? Like, it's kind of kind of new, or how long have you been? There it at least happens once. There it is. But, <laughs> it's really consistent, man. It's every season. It's, it's, it's I a, mean, it wouldn't be right if it, if it didn't happen. Yeah, it's got to happen. It's a pat move at this point. It's a signature move. Um, but how, how long have you had, uh, like, that this alien stock in your in your collection for now? Um, um, I want to say like seven years. Oh shit! Okay, he just he doesn't let a lot of that stuff out though, from what I know. Yeah, there is, there is, and oh, there is. Okay. Um, you know, they you could you could trace it back, and and this is a part of my theory. So like, this isn't true, right? And this hasn't been proven out. But if you look at um, some of Ed's older animals you could start seeing some patterns. Um, and I call it, and this is just what I call it, so this is not a name or anything like that, but, but they have these like certain circle, circular spots. So I'm like, I'm like, so when I see it, I'm like, oh, that's a spotted snowflake, right? But that's just, that's just what I say. Um, that's not what Ed says or anything like that. And I don't even know if this is true, but I, have a, I just pay attention to little details like that. And I notice that, um, um, there was an old school breeder, Marshall and Chris will know this, but like his name was Paul Miles. And the story is um, that Paul Miles bred his male to, um, to a really nice female. And that's how this female um, named Noelle was born. She came from this litter. And Noelle has these like spots on her. And some of those spots carried over to her offspring. So you'll see that on animals like... Um, uh, blizzard and um, there's th that was a phenomenal litter that that um, that Ed produced. But you'll see those spots on a few different you know of those like uh, like those snowflake animals. And then what happened was um, Ed you know like he held, he holds back the best stuff for himself because he's right. a collector, he's a keeper. He just he loves this stuff, right? So he keeps the animals that he likes, uh, which are the best ones, and then he sells the remaining. And so naturally, you know, he's going to start producing better quality over generations 
because he's breeding the best of the best. And that's how the alien stuff, that, that alien pattern appeared. He ended up breeding a snake that had those spots to another snake that had those spots. And I think, like, if we were talking about, um, you know, incomplete dominance and dominant traits, like, like what they talk about in, like, ball pythons, I think that the alien pattern might be just, like, a super form of, like, these spots. So that's what I'm working towards. I have a few females that all have these spots, and I've been holding them back. And then I'm gonna, my plan is to breed a male that has those spots into those females and see if I could replicate, you know, the pattern that Ed did. Nice. All this sounds so fucking dreamy to me. It's ridiculous. Yeah, Holding it's back awesome. spots, Ed Marino, all this shit is just so dreamy. <laughs> Yeah, those animals are dope as hell. They're those so are... amazing, man. I and joked with... with Ed. I said it looks like he's he's by the time he just is done with basins, he'll have created his own like U.S. locality that's evolved into its own thing. It's not even <laughs> yeah. it's like, it's like su- it's, solid it's, white. It's like a subspecies that you could classify it as. <laughs> yeah, but Alan, but Alan, what, you know, one of the things you should definitely be proud of yourself about is just the quality of work that you put in the other hands of people. Like shout out to the homie Tim. You know, Tim Park who's not too far from me. Um, I've seen, like, I Tim's saw this thing. Collection. Dude, oh, my God. And, you know, Tim's very meticulous, and he don't play. Like, he's making moves with the right people and right people only. And, you know, to see your snake in person and just see what he just added to everything that he's already building, it's pretty impressive, man. And, and it's just so it's such a dream of mine, you know, just to see something so just glorious. I don't, I don't know if I'm overhyping basins. I don't know what it is, bro, but I, I don't think there's no overhyping basins. They're just that amazing. And um, to produce some and put some in other people's hands who I who just love them too is just kind of a big dream of mine, you know? Yeah, Tim, Tim, that's my guy. And he has, he's building up an incredible collection. There's a, there's a few people out there, uh, but I talk to Tim frequently. And Tim's just, what I love about Tim is like, he's a down to earth guy. He's super. super humble. He's, you know, he he's not, He's not trying to chase any like um, pipe dream. He's not. Yeah, he's not. He's not like a cloud chaser at all. You know, he just no. does his own thing and he just focuses on what he likes. And that's what's so cool about you know working with you know with a certain species or a certain morph. You know, you could become. You could do anything that you want. I mean, obviously, it takes money, right? Like basins. They. We'll be honest. They're 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 expensive. You know, this is. Um, you have to put up a lot of cash to get, you know, um, to rise to the top, you know, like with basins and, you know, similar to other things, you can't think that I'm going to, I'm going to buy the cheapest one that I could possibly find. And then eventually I'm going to produce something amazing. It don't work Um, like that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's not possible. You have to put up the money in order to get quality. And then you have to, you know, do that over time and bring those quality back to quality. You know, you, so, you, know uh, you know, you know, it's a good example, Alan. You say that because people buy like basic patch- package vehicles, which isn't a bad thing. But you can't buy a basic patch vehicle and think it's going to come with the fucking bow system and something the next few weeks or some shit like it. Like you get what you pay for with the with the basins. Like what what you see is what you get as far as when you produce them, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Plus the amount of work and years of work that's been put into them at this point. I mean, you're not just buying. When you buy an alien or a snowflake or whatever, I mean that's that's Ed's work for the last thirty years yeah. to get to get to that point. You know, I mean you could start where he started, and maybe in thirty years you would get there, or you can just you know, yeah. like Alan saying, fork out the cash and then you're there, sorta. Well, sorta. One of the things sorta. that. <laughs> Ed's always probably that, ahead of all of us, though, I think. Yeah, yeah, of Ed's, course. Ed's, yeah, Ed is the alien on another planet when it comes to that stuff. That's fine. <laughs> Go ahead, Alan. What were you going to say? One of the things that Ed told me was um, 25% of the babies are going to look better than the parents. Got it. Okay. 50% of the babies are going to look just like the parents. And twenty, the remaining 25% are going to look worse than worse. the parents. Yeah. So, so yeah, you, you know, it takes a lot of work, you know, because basins, you know, like you're not going to breed a female until she's roughly five years old, right? So you already you have to wait five years just to breed her, and then when you breed her, if you sell your best looking animals, then you know you're going to be behind the curve to the person that bought them, you know. So you wanna 
you want to keep the best ones um, so that you can keep on, you know, raising the bar. And that's exactly what Ed did. He's a collector first, right? He he loves to have, you know, um, the best of the best. Right. And, you know, that's the only way that you can get there by just holding stuff back, keeping the best animals, and then continuing that same, you know, pattern of just, you know, pushing the bar. That's the problem in the ball python game right now. People don't want to just hold on to the best. They want to try to sell it and just make money when at the end of the day it has to be passion first, right? Like you have to be your you have to be your best customer. And you know, I I love all the support I get and stuff like that, but when I share a little bit of something that's going my way with either condros or emeralds, of course I have people asking me, "Do you have a wait list?" or, you know, "I want to be the first one." And I just laugh in my head first and foremost like way too ahead of it, but even if that was the case, fuck i'm not getting none of this shit's leaving are you kidding me like i'm gonna be fucking ed some at one point where i just have everything stacked to the ceiling and i'm gonna be happy about it and fucking ask me about my ball pythons all available i don't care but this shit <laughs> you ain't touching this shit you know what i mean and i'm and i'm firm on that for sure and maybe that's why the fucking arboreal gods are making me go through it because they know how bad you know it ain't about the money at all with this shit you know i just i just want this shit to go down and i want to make better versions of it you know um but that's where it all starts with right alan like you just gotta love this shit first and foremost otherwise why are you doing it yeah and eventually it doesn't matter what you do either right um in any business if you if you keep on you know i mean obviously you need a little bit of luck too right but if you keep on you know pushing the limits and you put the, if there's passion behind it and your goal is to keep on growing um, if you, instead of taking your profits out, if you reinvest your profits and you grow that business, eventually you could, you could have a larger capacity to earn more, right? Yeah. There's, there's people that, you know, make a living off of breeding reptiles. And, you know, what's so cool about that is this is what they love. This is a hobby. This is, this is everything for them. And it also bears fruit, just like a farmer, you know, planting seeds. But yep. before you could reap that harvest, you got to put in the work, you know, and, and, and I see it all the time, too, where, you know, people, um, people sell out of projects prematurely. Like if you think about Ed, if Ed sold his best animals in the beginning, uh, you would never see the basins that we have today. Never see it. Fact. Because it took, it took breeding this one to this one to make those babies. And this one was like the best in the world. And this one was the best in the world. And then together, 25% of those babies were something that we've never seen before. That's why Marshall hasn't sold a conjo in over two years, three years. No matter, no matter what you're working with, you can't, you have to keep the best of the yeah. best that you produce. I mean, that's that you're just, that's a you're short, very short sighted plan. If you do anything otherwise. Yeah. You're, and if you're, you're good. I was going to say, if you just, if you, you know, if you're just in it and if you just want the money, that's fine. But, uh, you're, you're, you're limiting yourself even that way. I mean, the long game always pays off more, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah come on, collector mentality, man. Like you have to be in this to want to collect the best. Like it's all about getting yourself the best that you could possibly get. And then obviously when you have so much of it, Oh, you're going to have all these people on your bumper wanting to get, get your fucking, your, your stuff off your hands, you know? And that's, Ed is like, it doesn't take much for that guy to sell snake. I'll tell you that much, you know, but uh, that's because, uh, that's because he starved people for so long and, and, and he's still very meticulous on how he lets stuff go. Like he almost finds the best snake per person. I feel like he's, you know what I mean? He, he puts a lot of thought into it. I think. Yeah, he does. And he's cool. He's like a cool dude. He's like I a love that. guy. He's a hey, uh, Ed, come back on my show, please. I beg you. <laughs> the one episode I'm shooting for someday, please. Um, that was a that was a legendary episode. Man. It, it was. was. I almost felt like it was a dream too, because it, it wasn't that. I mean, it was long ago, but man, I, do I have? I would just do it better. That's all I know. Um, if I had him back, but anyways, um, you know, I, I, one thing that we kind of skipped on, and I it just keeps haunting my head is because you know we're talking about how there's a time and place mm -hmm. to induce snakes with medicine and whatnot but shout out to gary shavino one of the sponsors of tonight's episode uh you know i've also gone to gary with concerns of like you know one of the snakes that uh, i've gotten from uh you know one of old forest's stock is 
you know, they, they had that little drool, like little through the nose. It was like not even drool, but like a snot bubble. And I remember asking Gary, like, dude, what is, should I be concerned about this? And he told me he either puts him in the incubator or he bumps up the heat for a bit until it goes away. So there are things you can do for an animal that are showing maybe light signs of respiratory um, by just adjusting things in the enclosure or putting them in the incubator, which is also good to know versus just going straight to medicine, right? Yeah, yeah, I've heard Gary say that, and I've heard a lot of people say that in the past too. Sometimes, like there's there's multiple versions of F10, which is that veterinarian uh, like cleaner, like sanitation right. cleaner. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a diluted version where um, people will put that into either a fogger or they'll put a snake into a tub and they'll put it into an incubator. Um, so they can monitor and monitor the, the temperatures and they'll basically jack the temperature up and they'll spray just a little bit of that diluted F10 um, and that helps to get the mucus out. I think, I forget the name, it's like a defibrillator or something like that. I can't remember the name, wow. but, but that, that, that's proven to work, but it doesn't work always. So what Gary does, I believe is, is he does that first. And he tries to, you know, heal them out. Uh, he'll heal the snake naturally, and then when that doesn't work, then he'll go, you know, um, towards like the medicine route. But but you're right. There's a few things that you can do to dial it in. Like what works for somebody might not work for everyone. And um, uh, so I remember talking to uh, Marshall back in the day about, you know, like how do I maintain humidity? And yeah. what he does, uh, I don't know if he still do this was um, I think he was saying like every few days you'll dump the water bowl and then um, then your puppy pad or your, your bedding will just absorb that water and that will keep the humidity up. And, uh, but that works for Marshall. But m my case, I tried that and it didn't work for me. And, um, and what I did was when I noticed that their mouths were open a little bit, I, um, I actually lowered the humidity so I think that when I was doing it, maybe my water bowls were too large. Maybe I was dumping too much. I think I put too much humidity in there and, um, and they were struggling. Um, and that's why I mentioned earlier, like you got to make sure that your humidity is not too high and not too low because, um, you know, if, if your humidity is too high, then they're going to struggle breathing. Just like, you know, Chris, in a hot day in, in Florida, I mean, that, the air is thick. The humidity is, you know, 90%. I lived in Florida for 10 years in, um, in Miami and a little bit in Orlando too. So, like, I, I know the heat. And the, the Florida heat is much different than, like, an Arizona, like a dry heat. Yeah. And mm -hmm. It's not it's a one-size-fits-all. It's, 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 tropical, it's tropical as fuck. Yeah. There's other, there's other like variables too, though, like the ventilation is big. You know, yeah, being yeah. humid and, and with, with good ventilation is fine, but being humid and stagnant is bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And that varies so, so much depending on where you live and what your room yeah, is. Yeah, everything varies. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So um, what I did was now I just, um, I added extra ventilation holes um, to my cages and I just drill right through it, right? So I'll show you that, show you that. Well, I'll just show it to you right now. You guys want to see it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's check this out. All right. That's it. Shout out to everyone tapping in. Please hit the like button for the homie Allen. Um, Ryan Young, you don't want this smoke. He's in the chat starting shit, Marshall. Oh, yeah. Very yeah. um, <laughs> usual. Yeah. I'm going to show you the a little bit. He's upset there's, about my. I have he's a um, Bronco. <laughs> Thank God there's no yellow emeralds, ladies. <laughs> He's froze. <laughs> no, you're, good. Up with the you're good. You're good, bro. Go ahead, Alan. I got you guys frozen. Am I frozen? You're no, you're not. No, frozen. you're good. Yeah, you're good now. All right, cool. So um, in here, I have the the mini split here, and then I have um, a fan here, and then there's another fan. Sorry. Whoops. So you're two good. fans you're there, good. and then I have two um, of those bath CFM fans. To, to draw the air out. And then inside the cage, this is one of them here. I have three vents in the front. Let me see, sorry. So three vents in the front. I have elevated water bowls and then a regular water bowl on the bottom. And then you can't really see it too well here, but there's 
two vents inside of the cage on each side, on the bottoms, and then on the other side. And then in the back, this cage will be easier to see. In the back, I have another, um, I think that's like a, a four by eight vent that I could open and close. So, and then there's also the radiant heat panel there. And then, um, but that's what I do. Some, sometimes the snakes, well, this one is like sitting on the wire for the radiant heat panel um, because he just prefers that sometimes. Um, so I just try to do as as possible um, just because they, like ventilation is super important. And then sometimes what I'll do is like after I miss the cage, I'll leave the cages open um, just so uh, they get a little bit more ventilation. And um, and then I'll, you know, leave the cages open, like the door open uh, as long as I'm in the room. There's been some times where I'm like, I'll leave it open and I'm running around and I come back. But luckily, the snakes that usually just sit in there, they don't really move much. But I'll leave the cage open for, um, you know, if I'm chilling in the room for, you know, 30, 40 minutes, an hour. Um, and then in here, too, I built this out. I have a huge um, humidifier. There's, that's the two um, heaters. And then there's a fan behind oh, it that blows the air. But this is, um, this is a trash bin that's 75 gallons because here, you know, the, the air is, you know, since I have so much heat in here and then um, in Rhode Island where I live at, the, um, the air is so dry in the winter that I have to constantly fill up um, humidifiers. And I mean, it was exhausting because I'll be filling them up, you know, sometimes twice a day. But now with that, with that 75 gallon, you know, um, trash bin, you know, I only have to do that, um, you know, once a month. So it, <laughs> that changes everything. <laughs> yeah, it's a game changer because, you know, I have two small children and, you know, a wife. So I'm married and I have a job and I have other hobbies as well. And I try to make this room um, as automated as possible just so I can, you know, so I can have a life. Right. I don't want to just spend I don't I don't want to come in here to turn the lights on and turn the lights off. I did that in the beginning. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you're in a rush, you might forget to turn the lights on and now they're sitting in the darkness. Um, or you just, you know, you're busy, you need to travel, you need to do certain things. And, um, and you, it's hard to have a life uh, without automation. So uh, it's definitely a time saver for sure. Yeah, but then also technology can also fuck you over too sometimes. So it's like, man, it's it's almost hard to just rely on anything nowadays. That's why I don't. That's why my ass doesn't leave home now. I just fucking you know. I'm not, I'm no, I know traveling's coming. I'm, I need to travel again soon. But I just love being home because I'm just every two. You know, if I need to, my wife hates it. But my wife's slowly starting to hate this room more and more. And I'm, I'm trying to be like, okay, let me get you back in loving again because like I just love being in here, and I always feel like there's a reason to being here. But there's also like, all right, everything's fine. Leave it alone. You know, um, having that shit on your phone and having it all automated will like let you be more free in, 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 into the world, which is a real good thing, especially if you have a nine to five and you're all, you know, you're not full time in it. You feel me? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll give you some advice as like a dad, right? You know, yeah, um, you know, you're, you're, it's your son, right? Uh, yeah. He's, He's not a year old. He's what, like, what, eight months, somewhere around there? Seven months and three days. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome, man. That's awesome. Um, like, these moments that you get with them right now, like, you'll never get back. And, you know, kids, like, they grow in stages and in chapters. And once this stage is over, that's it. Yeah. You, you know, and honestly, like, being in a relationship, you know, um, being married, you know, you want to make sure that your wife doesn't grow any resentment. Like, that's so important because she's going to be your biggest supporter. You know, your number one fan. When stuff isn't going right, you're going to need to lean on somebody. And the last thing that you want her to say is, like, yo, just get rid of these animals, you know, or, or just resent it because it's going to build up, like, animosity within the household. And, you know, you... It's, it's so important that you make sure that you cater to your family's needs. You know, the, the snakes are one thing and, and 
you know, the snakes didn't choose to be your pets. So you obviously have like these, um, these responsibilities and you, 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 you have to take care of them, right? There's no question about it. You, you gotta, you can't be a Samson, yeah. you know, but, um, but when it comes to your family, you just want to make sure that you're showing up more for your family than you are for your pets and, yeah. um, or for even for your business, because what's the point of all this? you know, if, if you lose that and, um, you know, in, in a relationship, you know, it's, it's so important that you make sure that, you know, you have the time available, you know, for just, just chilling. Cause she's going to need to lean on you for a lot of things. Yeah. Fact. And, um, and it's important. I mean, I'm not going to go into gender roles or anything like that, but, but as being a man, like you, you have these responsibilities and there's a lot of weight that's on your shoulder, things that you got to carry that are heavy, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes with the snake stuff and the reptile stuff, like you go through it mentally, like when you lose a snake, you know, you're losing out on a lot of things at once, right? Like, A, it's an animal that you love, you've been caring for it for a long time, and to see it go prematurely sucks. And then B, you know, um, when that does happen, it beats you down emotionally. And the last thing that you want to do is be beat down emotionally and then also deal with somebody else's emotions because, yeah. you know, maybe you haven't been present as much as you want. So, like, balance is so important. And I can't emphasize that enough. You know, I feel like maybe I'm talking about my wife more than somebody else's wife but um, or husband or whatever it is, whatever the situation is. Yeah. But, like, you got to make sure that you show up for these animals, but then you show up even more for your kids, for your family, for for your wife, for your friends, you know, because at the end of the day, like these snakes are awesome. And, and it's like, I'm so glad that I got all of these, but I don't want to lose anything, right? I'm trying to balance everything. And, and sometimes you're juggling and sometimes you fumble the ball and that's okay. You just got to make sure that you don't just keep on fumbling that ball. And if you do fumble it, pick it back up as quickly as possible and then just get back into it. Damn. That hits so close to me right now. You have no idea. Everything you just said right now was like, I felt like this was a therapy session. <laughs> yeah, so it's like relations, relationship but, but advice. It, yeah. It's like, I, I'm, I'm my hair standing up because like it, it, it's so relating to what's currently happening right now, you know, because, you know, I go hard. I, you, I'm here more than enough for my animals. I feel like, so I think that's right. <laughs> But my biggest thing is like I do all my podcast work, all my editing here in the room too. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like everything I do, everything that I need as far as to put food on the table is all in this room. Um, yeah. and, and But there are time and place where like, God damn it, my work's done. You know what I mean? So I feel like if I, if, if I want to find a reason to be in this room, I can easily find one. But there's just other things that like you're right. Like there's – there's things to balance in this world and it's easy to just go super ape shit on these reptiles and completely forget about the other balanced side of the life, you know? Um, and, and, and it's a good reminder, like definitely like, like I, I, everything's okay here. You know what I'm saying? Go fucking figure shit out there. And, and it's important. I feel like one of the biggest things I, and I think maybe because I have surgery coming up next week, but I, I have not been fucking around with my, my, my gym, my, my gym, uh, you know, schedule. Like I've been fucking hitting the gym pretty consistent, and I really and I forget like how good that makes you feel like just getting active right away to get your day started. You know what I'm saying? It just kind of takes so much load of stress on your plate um, just by moving around and stuff like that. So there's so many different elements in life that I feel like are important to that you got to do. But balance is everything, man. Without balance, what how can you even how do you how do you drive a vehicle without any kind of balance? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So important, man. I mean. Look, when you, you're gonna need other people, you know, you, you're yeah. gonna need not just your friends in the hobby, you know, that could, you know, bless you with certain animals. You're gonna need, you know, support, you know, because as a man, you you gotta be strong. You gotta carry the load. You have to, and it's not easy. And that's stuff that, like, usually people don't really talk about. You know, it's like what. I'm dealing with mentally, you know, and um, and then the physical part, like getting into the gym, making sure that you're eating right. Like I have a lot of gut issues, and you know, lately I'm j I'm just challenging myself to just 
you know, take care of that, you know, because I got to show up. I got to show up for the animals. I got to show up for my family. I got to show up for my friends. I got to show up for myself. Right. And, um, and to your point earlier, it's like, once you finish, like, it's easy to stay in the snake room. To be honest, there's no place that I'd rather be than in here. That's why I designed it the way I wanted to. I make it super comfortable. I plan on putting TVs in here, but I got to make sure that I don't spend too much time in here because other people need my time too. And that's the part that, that you got to balance out. You got to make sure that those people get your best time. You know, you can't give your best time to just the snakes, right? Because like, let's say we're talking about being a hobbyist, right? And it's like, man, I'm in a great mood. I just want to chill and just geek out over my snakes. I just want to like pay attention to every little detail that they got going on. I want to take pictures. Like say for me, example, right? Prime example. Um, I started Instagram and I started growing out my page and I'm posting every day and I'm like trying to take the best pictures that I could possibly take. And then I started thinking, why am I growing out this Instagram? Not, not that there's anything wrong with the Instagram, right? But my goal was, I had a goal and I'm like, let me get to 10,000 10, um, followers. And then as I, it, and my goal was to get there in a year and I got re relatively close. But people ask me all the time, how come I don't post? And it's, I don't post because I don't have time to post because I'm not trying to chase, and I'm not saying you are, I'm not saying anybody is, but I realize what my priorities are and I don't have time for it because I know that in this stage, my kids are super small. And once that time passes, man, it's gone. And yeah. there's so many things that you're gonna see Right, like when my daughter was like a baby, she would say certain things all the time and make certain noises. And then just like that, the next day, she never did it again, ever. And, it, and that's it, that's a moment gone. And you know, I like to sit in those moments more than I like to you know, post pictures of snakes so that I can see how many likes I can get. You know what I'm saying? And, it, and it's not about, it's not about, you know, kind of, chasing likes or anything like that. But it's really like showing up for the kids and for your wife so that, you know, she could, you know, be like, yeah, MJ got my back or Marshall got my back or Chris got my back. Like you want to make sure that you're there for those moments um, to carry them when they need it. And then when you do that, they'll also carry you when you need it. You know, one hand washes the other, but together both of them wash the face. And um, that's, that's why my strategy is, has been like, you know what, I'm going to do what I can uh, as far as like posting wise um, and as, as far as like sharing wise and as far as like, you know, spending time with my snakes. I want to make sure that I'm in this room every single day, um, that I'm, that, but my time in the room is limited to as much time as I need. And that might be you know, an hour or two, because I got to make sure, like, is anyone showing signs of a respiratory infection? Is this one showing signs that it's ready to breed? Is, um, uh, is, this, one, is this one ovulated? I'm not saying that you got to neglect. All I'm saying is make sure that you take accountability on your time and you're not just kind of geeking out um, in your hobby and in your passion, because... You like just like we were saying about how these snakes, like you know, you you keep the best of the best, right? And that's how you grow and you become a better breeder. The way you become a better dad is you give your kids the best that you have, and that doesn't necessarily mean finances. It means Gosh. like fun. So yeah. my kids, um, uh, my son just wrote me a card for Valentine's Day, and he's five years old. And the card said, I love my dad because he plays with me. And, you know, what I try to do is while I'm being a dad and I'm at home, I'm like, you know what? You want to play baseball? Maybe I don't feel like it. Let's go out and play baseball because I want to give you my best while we're together. And then um, I don't want to give them my worst. I don't want to, like, have a bad day. And then, and then my kid wants to chill. And then I'm, I'm going to give him that time. You know, if I, if I have some bad time, I want to, like, I want to put that aside and I want to make sure that the, the time that I spend with them is just straight quality because at the end of the day, we don't know how long we got, right? Oh, you know, we talk true. about Brian Barczak, not to get all like philosophical or nothing like that, but what's so dope um, about his story is 
he gave his best to us, right? But then he also shared, because I, I like watched his vlogs, he also shared that he didn't give his best to his daughter, and that was one of his regrets. And when I heard that, it just gave me goosebumps because, you know, I feel like some of the things that I've learned the most were advice given to me about what people said that they did wrong, right? You know, like if somebody said, um, let's say a, a different example. This is a true example, right? Um, I grew up broke. I, and when I say broke, I was the poorest kid in the school by far. And, um, and I grew up in a really rough neighborhood. And, um, and I didn't have a great upbringing. And I'm not, you know, not to get emotional or nothing like that, but, you know, I was an orphan as a kid. And, well, you don't know that, but I was an orphan. And I saw a lot of things that I didn't like. For example, my mom had a drug addiction and she passed, the, she died when I was relatively young, really young. Like I'm almost my mom's age right now when she passed away, but she's trying her best to raise these little kids. And what I learned from her was she had a drug addiction. I don't want to do drugs, right? Because I don't want to, I don't want to do that to my kids because I got to see what that was like. So I always had this mentality, mentality like, okay, I can learn something from this person. This person is doing something right. What are they doing? Let me do that. This person is doing something wrong. Let me not do that. And I learned, I, I've had a lot of mentors throughout my life. That's the reason why I am the way I am um, is because I lean on my friends. My friends have been my mentors. Some of them are watching this video right now. And um, they taught me so much stuff, how to be a good dad, how to be a good keeper, right? You know, snake keeper, how to be a good husband. And you, you need to learn from them. Um, you're going to make your own mistakes and you want to learn from your own mistakes. But there's so much value in learning from other people's mistakes. That's why I'm so transparent with the, with the snake stuff, because when a snake passes away, I don't want to talk about it. I, it. I feel like shit, you know, but I know, OK, on the other side of that, hopefully I can help somebody else out. And um, and that's what's so important about being a strong man and being a strong dad, but also being a leader. And it's yeah. it's it's trying your best all the time. It's learning from other people all the time. It's giving people grace when they make mistakes because everybody has their own trauma. Everybody has their own demons that they're trying to face. Um, so you gotta be gentle on them as well. Um, you gotta be gentle on yourself, but just showing up with love and showing up with a with an open hand and showing up intentionally and on purpose. I mean, that's the thing. If you just show up and you're just there, right? If you're just, let's say, you know, you're at home with the kids, you know, with your kid or with your kids, Marshall, or I'm, I'm not sure with your status sisters, but like if you just show up and you're, that's not good enough. You know, you got to be present and you got to, you got to bring the heat. You know what I'm saying? You got to, you got to show up and show out. You know, just sitting around or, or and this is not a, like a, a diss to anybody, but like hanging around and, and playing video games, that's not good enough. You know, we, we really got to lead by example. And that's, that's hard. And that's something that we didn't ask for. But that's what we got to do. And, um, and it's so important that we're doing this and we're, we're being the example within the snake community, uh, within, the, within the reptile hobby, but as parents and also as... Um, as, as just a, a male role model within the, the relationship. You know, the, your, your counterpart, your partner is gonna lean on you for, for their needs. And, um, and it's important that you, you're, you're there. You know, you're there showing up and you're, you're letting them know that when things, you know, when there's some uncertainty, that they could feel certain in you and in your decisions. And, you know, like I was saying, that's not always easy. And, um, but what I really love about Brian's story was the dude was super transparent, you know, through the through the end. And I and I don't know Brian. I met him a long time ago. This is probably a oh, wait, but I don't know him, but I felt like I knew him because I used to always watch his videos. And when he had when he when he let us know that he was diagnosed and, and he was going through it, you know, I think most people, including myself, would be like, ah, right, you know what, time for me to cut off the camera. But he like literally showed the whole journey. And he was super transparent about it. And I feel like that's so dope. It's so dope to be a person and be so vulnerable um, 
And you, he has no idea how many people he helped, you know, that are also struggling with that stuff. And there's going to be even more people, like he said, you know, like his legacy will live on. And when he passes away, that's when other people's pain starts. And, you know, it's like that to this day. We got to make sure that we're just honest with ourselves and we're honest with the people around us and make sure that you know where your priorities are. You know what I'm saying? Make sure that, you know, maybe your goal is to, like you said, you got all this money in this room. I know what you mean. I got a lot of money in this room, you know, and and things need to go right, you know, but if they don't, you know, you got to just make sure that you could adapt. But the point that I wanted to make, and sorry for being so long winded, was make sure you know what your priorities are. You like make sure you know what you're doing this for. You're doing me personally, and I'm sure like all you guys that you're doing this for a reason. You know, you don't want to just be head down, blinders, you're on the grind, you're so focused, you know, you're, you're making all these moves. Meanwhile, you know, like things are falling apart in the background, you know what I'm saying? So not really snake related. And um, and me personally, when I when, when I talk to people, it's usually like this. I'm like, I'm usually yeah. very transparent. And, you know, we're more than just snake breeders. You know, we're all, there's four men up here, you know, right. like, Snake breeders, that's that's a small percentage of, of who we are. Yeah. You know, we're, we're a big, big ass vessel. And, you know, we're, we just got to show up, you know, yeah. as much as we can for everybody. Life has so much to do with the reptiles, though, man. Like, it goes hand in hand. Like, without taking care of your life, you can't expect the reptiles to be what they need to be at. Um, but Marshall, I mean, I like, I've always looked up to Marshall because, like, I'll never forget coming into this. Like, I think I wasn't 2020. I was pre-2020, but I saw the excitement with 2020, like, sales and people coming in. And I remember going to Marshall's place, and I'm like, Marshall, how the hell do you not do this full time? And, you, and, and boy, were you smart. <laughs> now I understand your answer now, Marshall. But uh, Marshall was just like, nah, I just I, – I don't feel comfortable – relying on the reptiles um so marshall's always had a full-time gig as far as the nine to five goes not really nine to five but doing that being there for his kids um like marshall you go on road trips with your son for lacrosse shit um and and i feel like you do a good job balancing everything and and, and but do you ever feel like you're maybe caught up maybe too much in the reptile room and you need to break away? sure yeah, yeah like certain times of the year like when it's like it's more work than than fun yeah. um you know uh hunt totally uh but you know luckily like 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 alan was saying you know my wife's very supportive you, you know lily's supportive yeah. um you got to have a supportive uh uh significant other yeah. um in this that's the, you know that's really the only way you can do it i mean you can still do it but not at you know not at this volume or this level however you want to say it um without well, it's, it's like, it's without like, help yeah, I mean, you could do it, but for how long until it fucking falls apart? That's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, you know totally. I mean? yeah, totally. Yeah. So. My, my goal is to not let shit fall apart. So, <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> exactly. That's a good, that's a good it's goal. A pretty good goal, I'd say. It's a pr pretty straightforward, <laughs> right. honest goal to have. Guys, why don't we, uh, let's get a wrap up question. Let's get a wrap up question together for Alan. I'll go first. And whoever wants to go after is fine. But uh, we didn't talk. We didn't talk too much about importation. And I do kind of want to give shout to someone who uh, had a question in the live chats tonight. Um, and, and I do worry. I do wonder about this because you know you you go to a show right, and it's easy to get yourself a big, beautiful, well, it looks beautiful Northern Emerald Tree Bow in a deli cup, right? Fresh imports. But why not basins? Like, what is it about basins not being imported? Um, and I don't know if you know any information on that, Alan, or I don't know if you ever looked into that, but can we kind of just disclose that and kind of get to the reason why you don't ever see basins imported into the United States, like especially like Northerns are imported? Yeah, so two parts, right? So back in the day when they were imported, for the numbers that I heard, uh, for every 100 emeralds that came in, it was only two of them that were striped, so two basins, right? Mm -hmm. So first of all, they're they're not readily available, you know, even in the wild, like, you know, you just, you just don't really find them. So that's the first one, you know, even when they were exported or imported in, they didn't, they were few and far between. Um, second reason was um, Brazil, you know, um, stopped allowing them to be, you know, um, imported into the country. So right. most of them live in Brazil. There's some of them that are in Peru. I don't think Peru um, lets them in either. So, 
like the only way that you would see an import is either like imported from overseas, like somehow it got into to Europe and they brought it over, um, or um, somebody grabbed the basin and they maybe smuggled it into another country like um, um, Guyana, you know, or Suriname, and then you know they they brought it in that way. Um, but I think that they would be easily identified too. The only time you would really see a basin, you know, brought in a wild caught basin is you know basically through smuggling them. So it was it was Brazil that that, that closed that down. I think it was like I want to say 2002, 2003, somewhere around that. Damn. Yeah. So wow. basically, once that stopped, you know, once they shut it down, that was that was, was it. it. Yeah. yeah. And there weren't many too. To yeah, with. exactly. There weren't many to begin that's with. That's why. That's why people say, oh, basins are so expensive. And it's like, well, I mean, they are expensive because, A, they're hard to make, but there's not that many people that have them. You know, right. there's a reason why, you know, uh, uh, you know, a supercar like Bentley, Ferrari, you know, um, well, Bentley is really not a supercar, but, but Ferrari and Lamborghinis are so expensive because they're not mass produced. You know, if they were, then they would be cheaper. And so the same thing is true with basins, you know. And honestly, people talk about prices all the time. Basins, if you think about it, basins are actually cheaper now than they ever have been, even though they're expensive. And the reason why I say that is because the quality that you get is so much better, right? If you would have got a basin, let's say, 20 years ago, maybe you're paying five to 10000 for that basin, and it has a thin stripe. It doesn't have much to it. But now for that same price, five to ten thousand, you can get something with a with a with a more impressive, you know, stripe and markers. And that same one, you know, a long time ago, maybe that would have been a thirty thousand dollar basin. So yeah, basins are really ex expensive um, right now. But if you look at the history of basins, then you know they're they're relatively cheaper. Yeah. Damn, it's a good point. All right, who's next with the wrap up question? Uh, I'll go. Um, I was just going to ask you what's going on with the HQ stripe stuff, uh, what your progress has been with that. And, and um, I know you had some, do you have two or three of them? I can't remember how many. So I, 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 I brought in a uh, one, the original one, which is a female. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be a male and I built my whole collection around this snake. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember. And, um, so it sucks. I mean, I didn't want a female, but I got a female. That's what it was. Uh, mm -hmm. She produced a litter and I produced two babies. I kept one, and then um, and then the other one went to Ed Marino. And mm -hmm. what's so cool about this, he just, um, I'm not sure, I'll share it, because I don't think he has a problem, but Ed hasn't allowed a snake into his collection in over a decade. So this is the first snake that he's ever picked up, uh, and that was a couple of years ago. So that was like a very honor, like it was like an honorable thing for me, you know, like, yeah. like yes, you know, Ed got, you know, a Broke snake. through that wall, man. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's so cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's awesome. But so that female stroke, the original female, I bred her again and um, she passed away, belly full of babies. Damn. And, you know, it was mm. sad, too, because I went I went and I checked on her. She was fine. This was like day like 188 or something like that. Um, I checked on her. She was fine. Then I went back a few hours later and I found her on the floor. So I opened her up. And I like the babies were all ready to go. They just for some reason they couldn't they didn't come out. And four babies, she had seven babies, four of them were striped. Mm. So I lost her and that litter. Um, the problem with her um, is that she wasn't drinking. You know, the first time I bred her, the, her first litter, when I, I had a rain chamber and I would just like put her in that rain chamber and just let it rain on her for an hour at a time. And I was doing that, you know. Um, let's say two or three times a week. This time, I'm like, all right, let me, like I did that before, other people don't do that, let me just leave her alone. And I would change out, give her a fresh water bowl pretty much daily, but she just never, she, I, ne I never seen her drink. Mm. Um, so mm. she was very lazy, she didn't really move, she was uncomfortable. And I think ultimately she, like the reason why she couldn't pass those babies was maybe dehydration, I'm not sure. So, you know, now I'm in this, I recommend people, if you have that, uh, a, a rain chamber, um, and that, that's a topic that I wish we would have discussed, you know, but we're running out of time. But, uh, but if you have a rain chamber, you should definitely do that with grabbing females. Um, but so, sorry. And then um, the room here, like as I was trying to figure out this room and figure everything out, 
the my room, um, the, the the heater stopped working in the middle of the night. I didn't have any like like alerts or anything like that set up in the room yet um, because we had to rush into this place. And um, the, 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 the heater stopped working. The room got into the low 40s. She developed a respiratory infection. I started treating her, but she just never bounced back and ultimately she passed. So I have no HQ strikes. There's only one left in the whole country, and that's at Ed's. Oh, is that so is that a, an incomplete dominant? I yeah, guess. Dominant. Yep. Yeah, okay. Sounds like it. So there, we'll we'll have more, but thankfully, you know, there was a lot of people that made an offer on that snake, really good offers, but I was like, nah, I want to put this snake into Ed's hands. And look, I mean, if I would have sold that snake to like a relatively new keeper, that would have gave given me all the money for it. Um, and they lost it, then the whole HQ stripe, like the, G I mean, it's still in Europe, but it would be lost in the United States. Thankfully, it's in Ed's hands, and like, who, who better to have that snake, you know? Exactly. So, is it is it male or female? Uh, it's female. Crazy news: that litter, at th that litter was uh, eight babies, all female, no males. Wow. Yeah. I'd like to see him breed his like highest white male to it. To see if, if, I, if it, I guess it would just still have a the a HQ lot. stripe, huh? Yeah. So that snake was also bred to the alien sire. So the, my plan was to like, okay, maybe I could produce some alien HQ stripes because I believe that 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 pattern is also genetic. Um, so who knows what Ed's gonna do with it? I know that he has a, a male that has a really thick stripe, and that was his plans before. But you know how it goes, man. Plans change. And you yeah. know, he might put an alien male on that. He might put a male that has like a frosted male, or he might use that male that has a thick stripe. All right. What you got, Mark? Uh, I'll keep it simple. What what is your number one uh, goat basin? Not necessarily uh -huh. yours, but if you yeah. could if if you could pick to, if you could pick any basin to have. Yeah. Um, I mean, my favorite snake, my favorite basin is that alien, um, the original alien. But if I could pick any snake, it would, uh, any basin, it would just be a pet. I would keep, I would take Noel because the whole snowflake stuff, like it, it really started with Noel. I mean, it was, it was, it was around before her, but like that snake is just like iconic. So like I would take her and just keep her as a pet because I don't think he's breeding her anymore. Um, but if I could pick anyone to like keep and breed, then it'll be the alien for sure. Damn. And from oh, what I hear, from, from what I heard, like Ed, Ed always talks about like the closest or the more white you could get to the closest to the nose or to the head is like the ideal thing when it comes to, I don't want to say anything, but what is it about him and, and wanting more white to be closer to the tip of the face? Well, cause that's, that's an area that like was so hard to achieve. Right. And everybody has their own thing, right? So right. before, before, like, Ed's whole, Ed, you know, back in the day was really known for, um, for, for diamonds. Right. He wasn't even really a big fan of snowflakes. Right. You know, Ed, Ed, Ed is a, um, he's a machinist. He's very detail oriented. So he, he wanted to produce the best triangles, the best diamonds that you could possibly make. And he wanted a very thin, thin stripe with really large, you know, um, diamond, diamonds on them. And then I think it was, um, you know, Tony that was like, hey, you know, I got this snowflake, you know, um, you should take it. And, you know, Ed went for it. And then he ended up getting the well and um, Flower Girl and a bunch of others. But originally right. he, was, he was into the diamond pattern. Um, so I, I feel like it's to each their own, you know, like he originally, when I produced the, the, the HQ Stripe, he wasn't really a big fan of it just because it just had a pinstripe going down its back. There wasn't much more than that. But then, you know, like your, your taste and like changes over time, right? You know, you might like, you know, you might like burgers and then all of a sudden now you're a steak guy and then now, you know, maybe you like the fillets, you know? So um, I think now he just wants to produce stuff that is really challenging to replicate and stuff that we've never seen before. And thank God he's willing to just like set the bar higher and higher. Cause once I produce something like Draco, I don't want anything else to be honest. That, that right there is like, that snake's outrageous. Like that's yeah. a, I, I feel like, I feel like if I go to heaven, is that the black, is that the real dark one? 
Yeah, that, yeah, that's my that's my that that'd be it my doesn't even look one. real in the photos. It looks like it's been fo- photoshopped. It's, it's funny too. Me. Ed was not he's not a he's not a color guy. Mm-hmm. He doesn't he wasn't trying to breed for black diamonds. He right. he, he liked it, you know, because we talked about it a lot. You know, Ed is me and Ed's one of my mentors, right? You know, I have right. mentors for every area of my life: health, wealth, happiness, family, relationship, everything. But when it comes to basins, man, like Ed's the GOAT, right? And we talk a lot. And, you know, um, when it comes to Draco, obviously, you know, he loves Draco. But but back in the day, I mean, there's probably other dark basins that he ended up selling off because he wasn't going for that particular look. Now, luckily, he, he, kept, that, he kept Draco. And if he liked that look, maybe he would have produced even more Draco-like babies. I know that he just produced a... A litter with Draco not too long ago, so hopefully right. we, we will see more of that. But um, but yeah, that that's another one, right? Like black basins are another, you know, like pattern um, or color mutation that like I can't wait till we see more of. But I know that Steve has been, you know, putting in a lot of work with that with that the melanistic uh, basins, and I think there's somebody in Europe too, a couple mm-hmm. of people in Europe, uh, even on the northern side. Yeah, yeah, this is dope. Respect to all the basin keepers out there. Just, just thank you for being, uh, you know, the the. I guess I don't want to say the one percenters in the reptile game, but God damn, there's just not enough of, be- you know, not enough basin keepers in the game yet, you know, or emerald tree bow keepers at that. But I, I do know that's just only a time, uh, a- 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 in the making for sure because you know this hobby is getting bigger. There are people out there who are just so just like like myself and you guys just obsessed with this species who. You know, the good news is with more people coming in, these snakes will end up in the right hands and people will do work with these snakes. And I have already I'm already close with a few people um, that are on their way. And so it's just a time, uh, you know, like I said, just only a matter of time. And I got to say, this uh, episode was awesome. Very insightful, bro. And definitely that that rant, man, I'm going to re-listen to that again, Alan. I appreciate that information. And uh, I know it came from the heart and we had just shy of 100 people tapped in on tonight's show. So. Um, what do you have to say to all the love and support that not only that you got on tonight's show, but just everyone out there who's just happy to see you just being where you're at and just kind of just passionately just moving forward with the bases. What do you have to say to all the support out there, bro? Yeah, I just, you know, I, like, I appreciate it, you know, and as I'm not really chasing anything like that, you know, like I really just want to be my authentic self and, um, I just want to love and show love. And, um, and I just, you know, I love people that, <clears throat> that are just trying to, you know, do their best, you know, and thank you for showing support, you know, as I really appreciate it. Uh, but, you know, just keep on, keep on just doing you, you know, be the best person and the best version of yourself. And if we could all do that, man, the world would be like a better place. Hell yeah. Shit. Um, for people out there to be on top of what you have going on, I do know your Patreon's still cracking, right? So, please head over to his Patreon page, which is in the description below, but also Instagram too, Alan. Do you feel like Instagram's the best way for people to follow you other than Patreon? So I'm on Instagram actively, you know, like I, I, you know, I, I message and I like people's stuff. I just don't really post. So right. it's like I have like an invisible account, which is all good, you know? So if people want to send me a message, Instagram, you know, Facebook too, I'm on Facebook, but um, I just don't post much. Okay. Amazing Basins on IG. Uh, hit him up, give him a follow. But yeah, man, what a great show. Appreciate you so much, Alan. It's a wrap for the homie Amazing Basins. Give it up, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate you. Hey, have a good night, Alan. Thank you, bro. Hey, Alan, guys. see you, man. Good night, Chris. Damn, man, that could have easily gone another two hours. Sucks. Um, but what a great show, man. What, what do you what do you think, Chris? You know, you got to you got to jump in, uh, celebrity co-host tonight. What do you think of tonight's episode covering the emerald, the, the the basins? I love it, man. I always it's it's always good hearing from Alan. He's definitely somebody that inspired me as I was getting into emeralds. So cool to to, to meet him and, and hear his thoughts on everything, and really cool to see him getting that that room set up and and getting everything going again. So I, great episode. What you got, Marshall? No, nah, yeah, I agree. I lo- love Alan. He has uh, so, so many questions. Uh, like you said, could have gone another couple hours. Sure. Had more questions about the the room, his you know, temps. Like, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of stuff we didn't touch on. Well, hopefully Bill goes back to Mexico soon and we'll just bring him back on. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is a great show, man. And, and you know, man, I, I 
I do tend to go sometimes heavy on one um, species. I feel like when, when like, you know, we love chondros, right, uh, Marshall? But we have to at least balance out this emerald chondro thing at some point. You know, I don't, I feel like we've gone too long without talking about emeralds. Yeah, I didn't realize all of the trees was only chondros. I mean, I mean, it's not though. It's really it's for anything in the trees. That's kind of why it is. But it's like you know, when you have the mayor of Conjure Town, how do you not go other than? Con I mean, well, you're supposed to stick to the script, I guess. You know? Right, right. But the guy loves his Mexico trips, and he loves you know being the mayor. So he, you know, this is why we take advantage of times like this. And uh, I feel like that's what we'll do. I think anytime Bill steps away, it's emeralds for sure, hundred percent. Because he don't give two shits. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't like emeralds. He can't. His hands are too delicate. He can't get bit by him. He doesn't want. Oh, yeah. he, well, when he when he was in his profession, he would say it was too much of a risk to. That's and that's, that's true. Legit. Yeah, man, they can they can tear you up. I was just gonna. It's kind of funny. I didn't even notice it until now. Yeah, the dude, whole time been, they've been doing this for now. a while, dude. They locked been up. Locked, yeah, nice. I was, the I whole was like, time <laughs> I saw him moving around, but because I just put him back in there. But yeah, they're locked now. I saw the cording. I'm like, bro, that snake's gonna be locked up in no time. And sure enough, yeah, he does. That, that male doesn't waste any time, man. He just he doesn't That's fuck around. Epic. See, I knew I knew Chris Rice is the best co-host for tonight. He even lights on right and there. lights on and everything. Yeah, lights yeah, on. And that fucking. male doesn't care, man. He's I lucked out with him. He does. He could care less. He's, yeah, man. Um, again, Chris, thanks for coming by and hanging out with yeah, us yeah. tonight. It means thanks a lot. Inviting me, man. Spirits. Is it just spirit snake on IG or what is it? Spirit uh, snake spirit. Snake Spirit, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Snake Spirit on IG. If you really want to see how he does his stuff, man, it's awesome to follow. So go give him a follow on IG. And then, of course, Marshall Mendez, Red Mountain Herps. Uh, give him a follow as well. I appreciate you two for coming through, but enjoy the rest yeah, of your night. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Good to yeah. meet you, man. Yeah, good meeting you as well. Man. Get up for my two homies, Marshall Mendez and Coach Rice. Peace Come out. Man. Take it easy, y'all. All right, Chris. Thank you, bro. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Later. <laughs> I love this. Uh, appreciate you guys for hanging out. Uh, oh man, I just, I wish I had two more hours. I'm not gonna lie. Alan had, Alan has learned a lot, and he's down to share it all. That's the beauty about being friends with someone like Alan, or he, or even just following him on IG. He even said, "Hit him up." You know, the guy is just a really nice, like open door type dude when it comes to the reptiles, and he'll he'll he'll, he'll put you on just because he's put a lot into it. You know, so I appreciate a lot of people like Alan who are just so passionate behind the reptiles they work with because that's the example we need to give to anyone coming into the reptile game you gotta love it first before anything else before any of this money shit that you think of it has to come from the heart man and i don't want to be all cheesy about it but love what you work with and then everything else everything else will fall into place all right so again shout out to the emerald tree boa lovers or the new emerald tree boa lovers i should say i mean i'm trying to convert as many ball python keepers or any other keepers of reptiles into the emerald tree boas and the chondros because this is this is art this is art you want to talk about a delicacy in the reptile game you're tapped into it now especially the basin so appreciate you guys uh enjoy the rest of your night be ready thursday night big things popping with me and justin from canova we're going to talk about that article that he was in uh the new yorker so be ready for that it's going to be awesome and hit that subscribe button guys i appreciate all the love and support um it helps me a lot if you hit that subscribe button I want to say shout out to all my subscribers. Shout out to anyone who listens to Trap Talk. You guys are awesome. And I'm just looking forward to just keeping this going and looking forward to just launching some really new awesome things for all you reptile lovers out there. Coolest reptile podcast in the world, and that's a fact. So, again, thank you to the co-host, Marshall Mendez, Coach Rice. You guys are awesome. Shout out to Alan, Amazing Basins, an amazing dude. Go give him a follow, and you will see Alan again for sure. You already know stuff that's round two three four and five worthy and that's that's my man alan here so enjoy the rest of your night i'll catch you guys here thursday and i'm out Cheers.